What is up, everyone? Let me give just a couple more seconds here, see who else we get come and join in. But today, we're gonna have some fun in Unreal doing some cool physics stuff. So there's a lot of really neat uh, physics uh, built into Unreal, because of course it's a game engine. I'm gonna show you guys kinda a couple different methods and give you some ideas and inspiration. Maybe you guys can work up some of your own physics stuff. I've been doing quite a bit lately with, um, you may have seen some of my shorts and little videos and stuff like that. Messing around with physics inside of Unreal. So we are gonna be just kind of playing around a little bit with that and kind of showing you how I set stuff up and move things and how you actually record the physics so you can actually play it back in sequencer. So just some different fun, cool stuff like that. Um, if you want, uh, make sure you hit the like button, all that kind of stuff now. Uh, that'll kind of help boost us up and get people seeing it. And um, give me just a second here. Move the chat over. That way I can see it. Cool. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started here. We're going to mess around with some, some fun stuff. So this is a blank project. I'm just going to use the, um, I'm just going to be using the uh, third person uh, character template there. Um, I usually use that one just because it always has a mannequin in it. So you can use that for size reference and stuff when you're building stuff. I will say a lot of times when you're messing around with physics stuff, you're actually scaling things up kind of large um, only because really, really small physics stuff doesn't really work super well. Um, uh, how's it going, uh, Stoidet? Um, I'm doing good, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah, this this should be a fun little, fun little one. It's always fun playing around with physics, especially in real time and simulations and stuff. So... Let's hop right in. I'm going to start a new level here. Um, let's see, you may not see this. Let's do that. So I almost always choose the basic level here um, only because it gives you at least some actual lighting and stuff in your scene. If you use empty, a lot of people use that one, but then you gotta add all that stuff yourself again. So I always start with basic. Don't choose the open world one um, because that uses like world partition and can be a little confusing and sometimes doesn't work how you want it. So. Let's hop into a new one here. So let's start out. Um, the physics and stuff inside Unreal is pretty simple. Um, almost everything that you use that's going to be simulating or doing something needs to have collisions. So a lot of your mega scan stuff doesn't have collisions turned on by default. So I'm going to show you how to do that and set that up. Um, so you've probably seen a few recent um, videos that I've kind of done. Um, with some different effects and things like that. So let me let me open up this one here and I'm gonna show you guys this clip real quick. Uh, this was a super fun one here. Um, this is just a number of the donuts that are included inside of uh, Mega Scans. And we just dropped a bunch of them and they simulate and bounce. And then we dropped the medium size one and they hit it and bounce. And then we dropped another big one there and it hits and bounce. So there's a little bit extra stuff going on in here. Maybe we'll get to towards the end, but you can see how the donut actually kind of wiggles a little bit and stuff. But we're gonna keep it pretty simple for most of this, but uh, kind of show you how you could do something similar to this here. So let's hop on in. And like I said, I'm going to go ahead and grab the character real quick from um, the actual character folder here for the third person template. Only because I wanna see some size reference. And like I said, when we do um, physics inside of Unreal, you're probably gonna scale things up a little bit because you want to, um, uh, super small stuff. It just kind of jitters around and doesn't uh, simulate super, super well. But physics is a really cool way to be able to uh, add some cool dynamics, stuff moving, interacting with each other, things breaking. Um, we might even get into fracturing here in a little bit too. So let's jump right in here. I've added a few things under Megascans folder here. So let's hop into Megascans. And I have all the donuts here and... We're just gonna, let's drag a few of these donuts in here, okay? And so you can see they're pretty small at the moment. Um, right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna boost these up to like 5X scale, just so we can kind of see them moving around. And let's uh, separate them out a little bit. 
And now that we have a pretty good size reference, we could probably get rid of the mannequin. We don't really need him. We don't need a player character there. Um, I will say this floor piece that comes in on this default level is kind of a weird piece. It doesn't always work or interact with stuff. So I'm gonna delete that one. I'm gonna come up here, add a new shape and a plane. We're gonna zero out the position and I'm gonna set this to like 100, just so we're a little bit above the you know, the zero access ground plane. And let's set it to uh, uh, 10 scale. We're gonna hop down here, grab these donuts here. Oops. And we're gonna move them right back up top. Um, I am going to turn off all my snapping. So let's turn off rotation snapping, all that good stuff there. And so at this point, if we were to simulate our scene, which we can do, uh, nothing, absolutely nothing happens at all. So, what we wanna do is we want to take this object. So anything that's inside of your uh, viewport here, we can simply just come over here to the details panel and search simulate. Uh, let's see. And why am I not seeing this? Oh, so uh, you'll see here that the simulate physics checks box is not available. And that is super, super simple because there are no collisions and you cannot simulate anything that has no collisions. Hey, what's going on, Farid? Um, yeah, we, we can maybe touch a little bit. Um, uh, yes, so the soft body was basically, it's not actually world position offset. Um, and it's not either, it's not really soft body physics either. So basically what it is that you saw in that video is it's a skeletal mesh with a few different bones inside of it. And we can cause those bones to kind of hit and jiggle kind of like a ragdoll effect a little bit. So it gives you that impression um, without being uh, actual like soft body physics or anything like that. So we cannot turn on simulate physics here. That's because there are no collisions. So let's go ahead and let's hop into the static mesh here. And you can see here, if we come up to the top and go to show uh, simple physics, you can see nothing showed up here. We can turn on complex, but um, you don't wanna use complex for simulating physics on an object like this. You can use that sometimes for a colliding object, something that is not being simulated itself. Um, so what we're gonna do is uncheck that for now. And real simple, we can always come up here and add just some basic shapes, so like a sphere, capsule, box, so forth. Um, we're gonna keep this pretty simple. I'm gonna come to this add, add, add 26 and simplify collision. So you're gonna see it has done an okay job, not super, super good. And one thing we can always do is if you don't like it, it's not detailed enough, let's go ahead and remove that. And over here on the left side, we can do this convex here. And if we crank up all these values here, it's probably not gonna do super detailed because it's a pretty small object. But you can see we got a slightly better detailed uh, collision piece here. It's a little small, it's kind of inside there, but that's gonna work okay for us. So first thing is make sure collisions is always turned on. Otherwise it will not work. And the best way to do that is open up the asset. You come up here to show and show simple collision. This needs to be turned on. Another thing to check is if you scroll down in the details panel here, you can see it under collision presets. We wanna make sure it's block all. And the collision complexity, it, you can change these settings to use, to try to use the complex collision, but um, it's best to just either choose project default or simple and complex. Um, that usually works great. So let's press save and let's go back into our map here. And so now if I simulate, you see nothing's still happening because we have not checked the box. So in the details panel, we're gonna come over here and now you can see simulate physics is available. If we simulate, boop, now we get a cool little donut dropping on the ground, right? So this will give us some sort of cool physics and dropping capability. So one thing that you can actually use this for too is you can actually use it for like scattering debris and stuff and say you're building an environment and you want to get actual like realistic looking dynamic trash or debris fall on the ground this works super good to do that so we're going to stop simulating here so now let's hop into these other ones here and go ahead and do the same thing. I'm gonna hop in here, crank this guy up so we get some decent results, press apply. We're gonna go up to show and simple collision is already turned on. And once it shows up, you can see it is there. 
We're going to press save on that one. Let's go back, top into this guy here. Same thing. And press apply. That'll give us collisions on this guy. And if you press, uh, if you don't know, a quick little tip, if you press F, uh, it'll zoom in on the object that you have selected or object that you're working on, which makes it a lot easier to find stuff. And last but not least here, we'll press apply on this one and get us some collisions. Cool. Perfect. So now uh, if we select these other ones here and we come over here to the details panel and turn on simulate physics, boom, now we get some bouncy droppy donuts. Um, so uh, in the video that I shared, there are several things that I was doing here. Um, I was converting these to a skeletal mesh, adding some bones. So when the donut falls, it's kind of like a ragdoll effect and the bones would twist and warp and bend a little bit which kind of gives it that soft body look. Um, we might jump into that here in just a little bit. Um, we will need to enable a couple plugins though, uh, but it's all built into Unreal, which is super, super nice. <clears throat> so um, let's take a few more of these and I'm just going to hold, I'm gonna select them all, hold Alt and pull up from it. Let's rotate and let's get up above. And let's do that one more time. We'll come over here, rotate again. So now we have um, several donuts. Now, if we simulate, they will all touch and interact with each other, which is super cool. One of the coolest parts about Unreal Engine is, of course, the real time aspect to this. So if we, oh, and to simulate, you can either press Alt S or you can come up here and choose simulate under the um, this little menu here. Um, I usually use Alt S, it's a lot easier. So one really cool thing about um, Unreal Engine is of course it's real time. So now that we have already simulated and these objects are fallen, they're still live. So if we grab this object here, I can actually start to move these guys around and they will live interact real time um, a lot of cool, cool fun that you can kind of have with this. Um, and you can actually mess around with this and record these. And so um, you can actually record this and use this in sequencer if you wanted to hand manipulate something or move something. It's really, really neat. Um, there is some wild stuff that you can do in Unreal Engine. I've seen a guy who has been creating uh, real-time puppeteering, kind of like Sesame Street style puppets and stuff, but real-time and I don't know if he uses like dials or if he's got like a, a VR uh, controller or something like that to control it, but real time bouncing and hair physics and stuff, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, okay, just a reminder from the level you can hit control E is the shortcut to open up the editor. Um, yeah, so um, exactly. So if you are on an object, so if you press control E, that'll pull up the object in the uh, specific view or whatever that you're using there. And um, you can always hop on back. Great, great um, tip there too. I appreciate that. Um, that's actually one that I did not know. Um, another good one is control B. So if you select an object in your scene and you press control B, it will bring that object up in the content browser too, which is a great way to be able to get to it pretty quickly. So yeah. This is a lot of fun, I will say. However, you'll notice there, we did have a little bit of um, glitching through. That does happen on occasion. Um, Unreal's physics is not perfect. Um, there are probably some secret dials somewhere that I am not aware of to help prevent things from clipping through. However, that does happen on occasion, unfortunately. Um, there are some things that you can do to help remedy that. Um, but uh, we probably won't jump into that for this specific one here. So let's see um, if we're going to <clears throat> mess around with some physics stuff here and have these drop. And then let's say we want to take um, a bunch of these. So one thing that we could do is we could always just kind of keep duplicating these over and over and over and just kind of stack them. And that's kind of what I did in my video there with all the donuts. I just had a large pile of them up here, right? Um, but what we could do is we can actually take these donuts, right? 
and I'm going to duplicate and duplicate and then let's select all of those again and we're going to duplicate them some more and like I said because this all happens in real time and you can still adjust it after simulating which is a lot of fun what we can actually do is now let's take and select all of our donuts here and we are going to move these up a little bit here and off to the side and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this plane. So the plane, uh, when you add a static object from the shapes here, these already come with collisions uh, enabled on them. So that works pretty well. Um, one thing that you do need to do if you want an object to be movable inside of simulation, you do need to come to your uh, details panel here and turn on movable. So I'm going to actually duplicate this plane here. And I'm going to set it there. And let's simulate again, right? So now, now we have a nice big pile of donuts um, and just lots of fun. So now that we have this on top of this plane here, if we want, we can tilt this and give us a pouring donut pile. So like I said, what makes this really cool is the live aspect in real time. We can shovel it around. We can pick up all these donuts. We can move them and scoop them through there. And in real time, they're all going to interact. And it is, it's actually a lot of fun, okay? So what we wanna do is I'm gonna show you how do we get this into say Sequencer? How do I re basically get this simulation and put it into Sequencer so I can render it out, right? So um, let's select all of our donuts here again. And we're going to move these guys back towards the middle here. And just for fun, we're going to take one of these here. We're going to duplicate them, set them here. I'm going to scale them up to, say, 20 and move them up here. Okay. So now if we simulate, we'll get the little ones. And then, boom, a big one kind of drops in there. Pretty, pretty cool. And you can see, like I said, for the most part, it does a pretty good job. You do get a little bit of this jiggle and wiggle here. Um, not not really a jiggle, but like um, this jittering as if it doesn't it doesn't settle right away. So it is one thing to be considered, uh, you know, consider when you're doing this. However, you can always um, there are a couple settings that you can do that will help remedy that. And maybe we'll jump into those in a little bit. Otherwise, um, the Unreal documentation has some really, really good stuff in there um, on how to remedy some of those issues. So how do we get this and re record it, okay? Or get it into Sequencer. So let's go ahead and let's hop up and do a new sequence here. And I'm just gonna give this donut that sequence, okay? And Let's go ahead and dock this down below. We're gonna move this down a little bit. So this is gonna be the sequence that say we want to use that we're going to uh, personalize ourselves. And then the other thing we need to do is we come up here to window and under cinematics, we're gonna choose the take recorder, okay? So basically what the take recorder does is it will record the scene or certain objects in the scene, okay? So what we're gonna do is take these donuts here, we're gonna select them in our outliner. So scroll down and select all the donuts again. And we're gonna take those and we're gonna drag and drop them into this take recorder section here, okay? And so what that means is every object that is located inside of this take recorder section means those are gonna get recorded, okay? And so, um, it will create its own custom sequence for it. So what you can do is you can come up here and say donut one, and we're gonna give it a name and there's some takes. You can modify that if you want, otherwise just leave it at one and we have a record button, right? So what we need to do first though, is we are going to simulate, but you gotta be quick. So by pressing this button, you're going to simulate and it's going to change to a pause button. So we're gonna press it twice pretty quick. We're gonna simulate and pause, okay? So if you look right here, you can see it is actually simulating because we have our stop button. It's only paused. And the reason we wanna do that is because now that it is paused, 
we start our take record and it's going to count down three, two, one. And once it's done with that, then we're going to press play again and boom. There goes our stuff. And now we're going to press stop. Okay. And you can see we got a couple pieces glitching through. So sometimes you're just going to have to run this a few times. It's kind of like real life. It's going to act different every time that you do this. Okay. So once it's done that done with that there, basically it's taken all those objects and it's added it to its own sequence, right? So you're not going to see it in your sequence here. It's not there. However, if you go to our content browser, which is control space, or if you have it docked below, um, if you jump over here in your folder under cinematics, so it's created a new cinematics folder and you go to takes and then it's the date. And now we have our donut zero one take here. So if I double click that, it's going to open up this sequence. Uh, it's closed our other sequence that we created and created or opened up the actual um, camera take sequence. So now if we click here, uh, another quick tip, if you press F, it'll take your timeline and shrink it into so that you see the whole timeline. So now we can take our actual scrubber here. And as we scrub through, you'll see the donuts play. But looks super weird. Why do I have doubles? What is going on? So what is happening is all of these objects, when it created this sequence, it's actually created a duplicate of them that are spawnable based on the actual uh, sequence. Okay. So no big deal. The best way to remedy this is you can either come into your outliner and you can see here that there are some that have a little lightning bolt and some that do, do not. So you can come in here and you can hide those different ones for that. Um, that way, when you play it back, um, those other ones are missing. I know it's a little confusing, a little complicated. So it actually creates duplicates of those and then sequences those. What we're going to do is we're actually going to close this sequence because we want to use our original one, right? So we're going to go back to our content drawer and we're going to go back to our main folder. This is where I put our original sequence. Okay. So now we have our original sequence there. And because we don't need all those individual tracks of all the different donuts that we just dropped, we just kind of want to, okay, I want this that I just played. So if I come in uh, here again and I go back to my cinematics takes in this, um, the date folder, I can now take this and drag and drop this into my sequencer. So now I have my primary sequence that I created, but I added a subsequence inside of my sequence. Okay. It gets a little confusing and you start stacking stuff up, but the, you'll, you'll get used to it. So now you can see I have that other sequence inside of mine. However, my original sequence wasn't big enough. Okay. So you can see this is my original sequence that I created. And then this red bar is the actual sequence that we did. However, because we paused it and stuff, it starts a little bit later. So just like any other track, you can actually adjust this and slide it over. So at frame one, you can see if I scroll through, you'll get all those duplicated ones going through again. Cool. So what we can do is we can take this here and we can slowly start to drag this over until we get the beginning yep, right there, the beginning of our actual animation. And that's where everything drops and we'll let's say stop it about right there. And then we can trim that down. Okay. So let's go ahead and close the take recorder because we're done with that for now. We'll use it again a little bit later as we do some other stuff. So let's drop this guy down and let's go ahead and create a cinematic camera. So we're going to go up here to add cinematic camera and add that into our scene. Let's go ahead. We're just going to jump straight into the camera itself and move around. Just kind of get ourselves a bit of a cooler, cooler looking shot here. We're going to take our cinematic camera from the outliner, let's drag and drop that into our sequence here. So uh, a quick tip for everybody, uh, a sequence always needs to have a camera. Otherwise it's not going to work. I've seen, I've had it, several people ask me, uh, Hey, I'm trying to run out a sequence, but it doesn't show my camera. Well, your camera has to be inside of the sequencer. And you also have to have this one here, which is called a camera cuts track. Okay. The camera cuts track allows you to actually add multiple cameras and you can cut between them all in one sequence. Um, without the camera cuts track, it does not work. 
And without a camera, you will not get good renders out of sequence. It just won't show up because it doesn't know how to reference the camera. And so in the camera cuts track, you'll see here, it actually lists our camera here. So one thing to be aware of is if this ever got deleted like that, the camera cuts track has no camera listed inside of it. And the camera cuts track is what Movie Render Queue uses to render out your sequence. So if you don't have a camera there, it's not going to work. So eh, you always want to come to your camera cuts track and click on plus and make sure you add the camera that you want to choose. And now you can see it added the camera way over here. That's because that's where my scrubber was. So now I can take this and move it here and just expand it. So it covers my whole scene there. Okay. And so now we have this uh, animation here and you will notice that we are kind of getting a little bit of weird shadows going on. Um, sometimes that does happen. Um, this is literally just a, a lumen issue. Um, and, but when you go to render out, you won't have that there, but sometimes it happens in real time simulation stuff. And when you're in camera, just not getting the same contact shadows that we normally do there for some reason. Um, let's see. Yeah. So let's make a couple quick adjustments to our camera just so it looks a little bit cooler. And as I mentioned before, so if you select one of our early on donuts here, you can see it's the donuts that don't have the actual um, lightning bolt next to it. So there's a couple things that you can do. Basically, you want to get rid of these donuts now that you have it recorded. And there's a few different ways to do that. You can either just select them and then hide them. You can select them and delete them. Um, however, if you do hide them, you still want to make sure you turn off simulate physics because when you go to actually render your scene, whenever you render, it simulates physics. So you're going to have all these try to drop again during your render along top of all these here. So we, we don't necessarily want that to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to um, just uh, delete all of these here because um, we don't really need them. We've already captured what we need. And one thing that you can do, so when you go to delete, it's going to say that there is a reference to this and stuff because um, you have the take recorders talking about that. Um, but you can usually just get rid of these and delete them out of your outliner and it's not going to affect anything because it's already still there. So let's do this here. Um, and this is not really the easiest process. And I imagine there's probably a better way of doing this, but I'm just going to come through the outliner here. Oops. And only select the ones without the little night lightning bolt, because those are basically being referenced from the, uh, other sequence and our take. So let's select these guys. Let's press delete. I'm going to do apply to all and you can see our, our all of our donuts from our sequence are still there. It's not deleting anything else besides just these other like placement ones from our original simulation here. And like I said, there's probably an easier way to do this. I'm not entirely sure. So we are going to just select them and get rid of them because we really don't need them. This is a very simple scene. Um, if you're creating something more complex and you feel like you might have to go back and re-simulate for some reason, um, you could definitely just leave these, move them out of the way, something of that sort. Um, that way it's not in your actual scene. And apply all, press delete. We're almost there. Just a few more in our scene here. Um, I'm also going to show you guys a fun little tool that I use um, for doing a little bit of physics stuff and like scattering stuff. Uh, it's definitely different. It's more for like a world building or environment building, um, but it's a pretty cool tool. Um, and I know there's other options out there nowadays, but I'm going to show you the the tool that I use for the specific um, type of applica application and stuff. Let's see. We are almost there. Let's just select them in the scene. Boom. Okay, so now you can see, basically, we have our scene here and all of our simulated donuts, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's just like a, for some reason, we're kind of getting this weird uh, shadow issue. I'm not 
Not super sure why. Eh. Switching to Epic seemed to fix it there. So maybe it has something to do with the, the render quality. Let's hop into our camera again here real quick and let's just make a few adjustments so we can actually get a nice looking camera. So I'll kind of give you some of the tips and tricks of how I usually set up a camera here. Um, under film back, I almost always choose um, a 16 by nine uh, DSLR, which usually gives you like a 36 by uh, 20.25 um, sensor size. Under lens settings here, I almost always do a squeeze factor of two. I really like that anamorphic kind of squish look. Um, this is something you definitely don't have to do yourself. Um, and then under crop, I always do 239. I really like 239, it gives you a very cinematic look. This may not be the most cinematic looking thing. However, sometimes just getting the right aspect ratio and using that squeeze for anamorphic can make a world of difference. Um, and we're gonna take this and probably punch in at about 55 on the focal length. Um, that's pretty good. A 55 to 85 works really well for that closer, more cinematic type shot. And then under focus, we're going to hop in here, turn on debug plane, and then we're going to use this to help us kind of dial in where we want to focus. And we're not getting a ton of shallow depth of field right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop over here. So before I usually make a ton of camera adjustments, I like to add a post-process volume. And the reason I do that is because I want to kind of lock in my exposure for the environment and the world and what I'm working with. You are correct. Uh, I could have sorted. That probably would have been an easier way. So if I would have gone, gone up here, I probably could have sorted by the actual uh, lightning bolt selection. Uh, thank you for that tip, dummy. Um, I forgot about that. You can do that. And that would make it easier. You could select it and then just hold shift and select them. That definitely would have made it a little bit easier. Um, let's see. Any tips on how to make a collection actor from a simulated props like these? I mean, hit P to save location to group. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Is there any way to make an actor with multiple static meshes included based on the level arrangement after simulation, I mean. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, there might be a way to do something similar to that using like a blueprint and setting up the, the, the meshes inside of a blueprint. Um, blueprints are great, but they're also uh, the bane of all existence. So that gets a little bit harder. And sometimes you, um, you got to know a little bit of the programming and nodes and stuff to get in the blueprints, but blueprints can actually make your life a lot easier, even just doing artwork and stuff like that. Um, helium balloon. Um, you know, we will actually play with something very similar to that here in just a minute. I'm just going to show you a couple things with our camera and then uh, I'll show you a pretty cool little feature. So um, under camera here, uh, oh, Actually, we are gonna add a post-process volume. So ho let's hop over to visual effects, post-process volume, and we're gonna search bound, turn on infinite extent bound, so that way it covers our entire area. And then the next thing I usually do is I come in here. So if you choose the basic level and the, the lighting that comes with it, so if I come to exposure and I set this to manual and I set this to 11, so anywhere between 10 and 11 is probably going to be pretty close to the stock exposure. So if I let me hop out of my camera because our our actual um, our depth or our, uh, aperture is going to adjust the exposure based on our actual um, uh, post process volume. So. Now that I'm out of the camera here, and if I go back to the post-process volume and go under exposure, uh, typically I set it to 11. So a good way to kind of check this is if I choose 11 and I uncheck this manual thing here, you can see, oh, actually I gotta uncheck both of those. So this is kind of our standard camera exposure here, and usually 11 matches pretty darn close. So I use my post-process volume to just lock in the general exposure so that um, when I'm working, everything looks okay, right? And now when I go into my camera here, I can come to the camera and when I turn on, um, you'll notice as I change my actual aperture here, uh, say 1.8, 
it's going to adjust, let's hop into the camera. It's going to adjust my brightness, right? And so maybe I don't want that to happen. I don't want it to affect based off of my aperture. I only want to use the aperture to get nice shallow depth of field and so forth. So if I come on down here to um, lens and exposure underneath my camera, and if I check on these two boxes here and I turn on auto exposure basic, and I set this to one, Typically what that will do is that'll match the same exposure of what is being done by the post-process volume. But even if it doesn't, that's okay. We can come in here and simply just touch this up a little bit and say I want it to like 1.5 or one. That's kind of exposure I want. So now if I come back up to my aperture and I said it's an eight, you're gonna see I still get the effects of the aperture uh, for depth of field, but it doesn't bother my actual exposure, which is really, really nice. So I want the nice shallow depth of field because I know we took, we scaled everything up real big just so things simulate a bit, little bit better, but these donuts would be small. And if you were shooting something small like that, you're probably going to have a shallower depth of field, um, depending on what kind of lens you're using, but most likely you're going to get a shallower depth of field because it's smaller objects and you're kind of zoomed in, punched in on it. So you could even take this to an extreme. However, you got to be careful, of course, with Lumen because Lumen doesn't do the best with shallow depth of field. I'm going to override our screen resolution here. And in fact, I'm even gonna take our engine scalability up to cinematic, just so we can kind of see. So now with our uh, camera selected, if I come in here and I press play, now we have a cooler looking shot here. Some stuff is thrown out of focus in the background. I'm gonna come in and actually, let's take our camera. I'm gonna pump this up to 85 for the depth of field, or uh, 85 for the focal length. So that's gonna give us an even more zoomed in, cool look like this here. And let's grab our camera again and let's set our focus plane because our focus plane has moved a little bit. Kind of set focus where we want it. And what's nice is since we've recorded this simulation, it's not going to be different every time. So we can take the, the recorded simulation. Now we can adjust our cameras and our focus and everything specifically for that simulated, uh, you know, recording, which works really, really good. You're not like, well, here goes nothing each time you record or like play it or each time you try to export a video. It's not just totally random each time, which works pretty well. Um, let's give ourselves, um, well, so anyways, a uh, quick tip. If you come down here to your sequencer or wherever your sequencer are located, you click this little gear and play here. There is a little checkbox here that says keep playhead within uh, the scrubbing range. So. What that means is if I click in here and I scrub through, it's gonna stop at the end of my actual play area here. You can still click outside of it if you need to, but if you're scrubbing through, it does that. So here you go. Nice, cool little simulated shot here. It works pretty well. Uh, down here in the left corner, there's also this little arrow here if you wanna turn on looping. So now we can watch it a couple times and it looks pretty cool. Like I said, Unreal's physics is not perfect. You do get some little micro jitters and stuff like that when things are still interacting. Sometimes you get stuff that clip through the floor. Um, it's just kind of part of the nature, unfortunately. There are a few ways that you can help remedy these, but nothing just totally gets rid of it, and it's not a super easy checkbox. Another fun little tip while we're doing this is um, a track that you can add called time dilation. So if you come in here and you go to uh, add track and search time dilation, Basically, time dilation is a, a way to change the speed of the entire timeline. So we've already recorded things, um, so it's not always going to be the most accurate way to do this. However, I've set it to quarter speed, and now you can see as our donuts fall, you get that cool kind of slow motion effect. And what's neat is you can always come in here and you can add keyframes. So let's set this back to one, and we're going to add a keyframe. And let's move about here. And let's see, we'll add it about here. We're gonna keep that at one. We're gonna jump forward a couple frames, add this to 0.25. And then say about here, add a keyframe, and then we'll ramp back out to one. So we got a few keyframes here. And now you can see when we play it, boom, kind of hits slow motion and then ramps back out 
Um, you can always boost these up a little bit or even take them down further. So let's take our boosted up ones. I'm gonna set those to two so that they're kind of like high speed and two. So it's kind of like doing speed ramps built into Unreal. You may desire to take this out to your video editor instead. However, you're gonna wanna make sure you render out at an appropriate like frame rate and stuff. Um, what's kind of neat about doing it in, in Unreal is the, the motion blur and stuff is all gonna be accurate because it's rendering at whatever frame rate and the speed ramps happening in here, um, which is pretty cool. And I'm going to set the slow motion of this to 0.1 instead. Uh, another little tip here is when we added that sequence into, um, we created our original sequence, we added the camera cut track to here. Um, there is a mismatch in the actual frames per second. I believe it was recorded in 24 frames per second, which you can always change inside of the take recorder. And our other sequence that we created was 30, so there's a little bit of hiccup there. So you'll see that little notification that was here, and you just want to make sure you match those up. Um, yeah, so I do have a video about physics-based scattering. We're going to talk about that one too. It's called the dropper plugin. Um, um, it is still a really good tool. Um, and I use it quite a bit if I'm doing just a lot of random stuff, especially for like environments and stuff. So eventually I'm going to do a video. There's a whole new tool uh, out called um, Dash. Um, it is a really cool environment building, procedural scattering, um, lots of, sorry, lots of really, really cool tools built into this one. Unfortunately, it's like subscription based, I think. Um, I think you might be able to buy a license for a year now, but it does cost some money and it's like continuous money, which is unfortunate. It's a really cool tool and it's probably worth it. I just haven't gotten into it myself. So anyways, we've done some speed ramps here and now you get that much faster and then a cool boom, slow motion. Really neat effect, works pretty well. It's not incredibly accurate, but I think it looks pretty good for Unreal Engine and you can have a ton of fun with it. So let's go ahead and stop that. So, um, uh, uno, Unada, Unada, Unoda, Unoda. Let's go with that. So one thing we can do is um, you can actually turn off gravity. So I think we're pretty much done with this one here. This is kind of showing you how you can basically set up a scene like this and you can use you know, a floor plane to help guide it. You could use, you could build custom tunnels so things kind of fall a certain way, kind of like if you're pouring something out of a box or out of a, you know, or dropping something. A lot of different ways you can do that. That way the items actually drop and collect properly and then you can pour them or dump them on something else and then you would record that using the take recorder. So pretty, pretty easy. Um, Let's hop in. Let's do another new level here. I'm going to do another basic level. And we're going to save this one and we're just going to call it Donut One. And so on this one, uh, we're going to do uh, another cool effect. So, like I was just saying, what we can do, um, let's hop into my mega scans here and see what we got. We might just do it with the donuts again. Um, if you ever load your content browser and you just get these little things like previews like this, if you just slightly drag them, and let go like that, um, you can get them to show up. Sometimes those previews don't show up and I'm not sure why, it just kind of happens. So let's do it. Uh, we've got these cool concrete pieces here. Um, so I'm going to just drag these out and we're going to set these to like five. So there's definitely some stuff, well, let's go to two. There's definitely some things that I haven't quite figured out myself, but I will show you, um, there was a, a, a little short or reel that I did a while back that had some other cool um, objects in it. So you were talking about um, a helium balloon. So um, I don't know how to do an exact helium balloon. However, you can take um, objects here and let's select all of these and let's move them up a little bit. And so we're gonna use uh, his quick tip there and we're gonna select the object and press Control E. That's gonna take us to the editor here. And you, like I said, we're gonna go in and show simple collisions. You can see there are no collisions, so we're not gonna be able to simulate anything on it. So we're just going to 
I'm not even going to crank these up. I'm just going to press apply. It's going to do a pretty basic collision on it, which is fine. Um, and let's, let's dock this in here. Let's go back to our scene. Control E on this guy. We're going to press apply and save. Um, make sure you always save in between doing the collision stuff um, because uh, sometimes it won't recognize those collisions until you do that. Um, save. A couple more to go. Sorry here. I should have had these ready to go ahead of time. I guess we could always go here too. Uh, no, I don't want that one actually. That's better. Two more, we're almost there. And so um, I haven't exactly figured out a real smooth way of doing this. And, and that's only because I think if you could do this in sequencer would be pretty neat. Um, because if you do it in a take record, it seems to glitch a little bit. However, we're gonna give this a shot. So let's select all of our bricks here, or rubble and debris. So this is definitely a way, like I said, you could basically take these pieces, kind of make several of them, scatter them out a little bit, and then let's let's actually do that. Let's just alt drag this up a little bit. Let's just kind of rotate it. And we'll move it. Alt drag a little bit again. Do this. We just want some variation and height difference and stuff like that. Um, let's do another one. So you can see how something like this could create some custom rubble or something like that if you wanted it next to something and have it actually like interact with objects around it. So you could you could set up, um, you know, a barrel or, uh, you know, some sort of other rocks or something that's already there and this stuff will react and fall around it. So let's select all of our rubble here in the outliner. I'm going to come down here to simulate physics and then simulate, so boom. Now we get all those pieces kind of fall. And um, I will show you a couple cool things here too. Um, so you could take these pieces now, right? And see they've fallen, a, they've basically stopped in position. I haven't stopped the simulation or anything. Everything is still simulating. So if I take this piece and I move it, you can see it's still simulating. But what is pretty cool is you could come in here and you were talking about a helium balloon, right? So if I select all those pieces again, and I come over here to the right side, there's enable gravity, okay? So if you uncheck this box, things will actually start to lift up a little bit, only because there's like a little bit of like initial, I guess, inertia or something moving it. So this could be a pretty cool effect if you created a scene. And I think what you would do is you would probably just do the same thing in Take Recorder. You'd pause your simulation. So we could come in here and we could pause it real quick and then press play. So say you wanted to do a space scene or something like that where things are floating around your actual environment. This could be a pretty cool way. And what's neat is this actual like real floaty gravity stuff. You're not having to try to keyframe this stuff. So I have everything selected. So if I take this and I move this a little bit, let me see if I can get it to... I don't know if I could do it with all the pieces, but you can see now I can actually take the pieces and I could kind of move them. And, and what I can do is, let me change my floor plane. Okay, my floor plane is movable and it has collision. So if I take this and I move it, you could see how that you could use that as like a force to affect all these other pieces. And like I said, what's cool is they're all collisions. They're all real time moving and stuff. So if they hit each other, they're gonna bounce off of each other. It's it's actually really neat. And it's a lot of fun though. Whoa, that's a little too crazy. It's gonna see if I can get something to hit each other here. You could definitely use these to kind of interact with each other and stuff like that. Super, super cool. So we press stop and we'll go back to our scene here. One more time, we can simulate physics like that. And this is all your standard physics with gravity turned on and we'll select those pieces again. So what I was mentioning earlier is, I don't know, I, I looked and I didn't see a way to 
uh, trigger gravity in Sequencer. Um, if there's a way to do that, let me know. Or if you have seen anything like that, it would be really, really cool. Because it'd be neat if, say, your sequence is playing um, and all this stuff's on the ground and then your character, like, hits the ground or does like a spell power or something like that. And all of a sudden the things start to float. I think that would be super, super cool. However, I guess what you could do is you could just have all this stuff there and you could do a take record and then eventually in the take record, press the gravity off button and then record that. I bet you could probably do something similar to that. So that might be a really neat effect that you could do. Let's do this one more time here. So this has all been simulated and dropped on the ground. We're gonna come over here and turn off gravity. Like I said, you can already start to see things float a little bit. Let's grab our floor plane and we'll just move it up just a little bit. And man, I mean, it's just, it's super cool. It's kind of definitely gives me like a, a very like spaceship type vibe or something like that if you wanted things floating around. Um, I bet you could even take a character in here, set it up with Ragdoll and turn off gravity and have it float around like that and interact I think would be really, really neat. Um, you could definitely simulate stuff in, in Houdini. Like if you're if you're fluent in Houdini, I mean, absolutely do some stuff in Houdini and bring it over. Um, you can either do like Olympic or something like that and bring it in. I'm not experienced with that. I don't use Houdini at all. So I'm not too sure on how you would go about doing that. But super, super cool. Um, so one other thing that I want to show you here is, let's see, I got, got a few other bricks. And eh, we'll just, we're just going to do it with this here. Let's say we were building out an environment, right? And we had... Uh, say a building or something and we wanted to I'm gonna drag this guy in here let's scale him up it's building out an environment and I want to be able to kind of simulate the physics for actual like rubble and dropping stuff so I do have a tool that I use to do this however if you don't have the tool you can just come in here and we're going to basically select our stuff and we're gonna simulate physics right so now this is all like kind of dynamically fallen into our scene and is like laid out like real rubble because it's all laying on top of each other and so forth. If I come in here and while it's still simulating, I right click and I press this button here. It says keep simulation changes, right? Uh, you can also press key, uh, K on your keyboard. So if I press that, boom, what it's going to do is I can stop the simulation now and it has kept all those pieces in that position. So the only unfortunate part about this is if you want to run it again, you can't run it again because they are all now in this position instead. However, this makes it really, really cool if you want to actually build out an environment and have like realistic looking rubble and stuff on the ground as if it's actually fallen in that position. So that is a really cool way. So if I come back in here and I simulate again, all this stuff is still... Uh, simulatable and it's all got stuff turned on. This one isn't actually turned on here, the big one. However, um, all of this is still here. So if I wanted to like, ooh, I don't like this just right. I want to actually bring this stuff in, kind of sweep it in just to art direct it just a little bit. You can absolutely do that. Or you're like, I want this piece to actually kind of be up here. I can kind of come in and do that. I can pick these pieces up. And I could, uh, let's see, grab it here. I could bring these up and just kind of drop it again. Okay, cool. Now I like that. And now what I would do is I would come back here again and I would select all the pieces and then right click again. And like I said, you can do this or we're just going to press K on the keyboard. So press K and then we're going to stop the simulation. And there you go. Now all that stuff is going to stay there. So now this is a great little object. You could add it to a blueprint or group it together. And now I have a really cool custom made rubble pile that I did myself using physics. Super, super cool. Um, let's see. Let's go ahead and save our project just in case. So we're going to call this rubble. Um, so in this same project here, let me show you the tool that I use for doing something very similar to this. So the tool I use is called the Dropper plugin. Um, I will leave links down in the description after the video is over. So it's D-R-O-P-P-E-R, -P -P -E Dropper. And um, 
what it does is when you come up here, you have an actual dropper selection here and basically pulls up this panel. So now what we can do is I can come in here and same type of concept. Any object that you add inside the dropper plugin needs to have collisions enabled and simple collisions. It can't be complex. So we're going to take our other rubble pieces here and I'm going to drag and drop them into this here. Um, uh, Stoydent, yes. Um, right after this one, well, actually, I'll I'll show you quickly how I did the donut. Um, is really cool effect. So you'll notice it's actually simulating currently because we're inside of the dropper plugin. So you're gonna see some of this other stuff possibly jiggle and move there because it is currently simulating still. So if you wanted those pieces down there to stop, you could now select them and turn off simulate physics. That way they never jiggle or move again. So now that I have this in here, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the foliage tool, okay? So just like the foliage tool, you'll drag and drop your meshes in here. And under each mesh, you can adjust things like scale and rotation maximums and minimums and stuff like that if you want to adjust how it uh, varies in between drop. Up here at the top, we have the drop tool selected. There's a remove and a sweep, and there's also a tilt. Um, this must be a no, uh, new one. I have, haven't actually used this one. You have a radius and a height. So the radius you'll see is this little circle thing that shows up. So uh, the circle thing is basically a tool. Imagine it's like a pour spout or a bucket, right? And so wherever your cursor is, if you see where my actual cursor is, that little pour bucket is above that, okay? And so 200 is the radius of the actual bucket itself. And the height is how much above your cursor that objects are going to drop from. Sometimes you might want to drop them high. Sometimes you don't want to drop them too high because um, it gives them too much chance for them to spread out. So you want to drop it lower. And then you also have a number of actors here. So there's two different modes. There's automatic and semi-automatic. So automatic means you can just hold down the button and it will continue to pour out pieces at 10 pieces a piece uh, each time, boom, 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 over and over. Semi-automatic means every time you click, it'll drop 10 objects. So I'm gonna come in here and just click it once, and there you go. We had 10 pieces drop out from that height and so forth. These pieces are gonna look a little small compared to here because we did scale these up. So I want to actually take this, I'm going to do a smaller radius of about 100. I'm gonna set the height to 100 because I don't want it quite as high in the air. Now that we come down here, you can kind of see about how high we are. And so each time I click this, boom, we get objects that are going to drop and scatter, right? And I can do this a lot. So depending on your computer and your horsepower, you want to be careful with this. So if you feel like you need to keep dropping a lot and a lot and a lot more, what you're going to want to do is drop several and then pause it, or actually you have to stop it. So when you stop the simulation, um, what that does is it takes all of those pieces and it sets them to static meshes and it puts it into a folder in your outliner. So if I press stop right now, it's gonna take a few seconds here to calculate and convert and everything. So it's gonna take all those pieces that we just dropped, okay? And, and it might give you this little warning because it's set to movable, it's no big deal. So if I come over here, there's a folder called dropped actors here. So I can literally hide all those dropped actors now. So I can, this is an easy way to come in here and be like, oh, actually I had one totally run away and I just don't want it. Now these are all individual static meshes and I can come in and delete that. But look at our rubble pile now. It's way more detailed, right? And so I'm gonna hop back into our dropper tool again here. And I still have those same meshes inside of here. I'm gonna do the same amount, but I'm going to crank up the actual actors to 100, right? So now if I click, 100 of those are gonna drop out. So you're kind of getting this exploding effect because the radius of the actual dropper itself uh, tool is too small. So it's trying to spawn 100 pieces in this little radius, which causes them to kind of go, which you might want. That might be a cool way to show like an explosion was here. So I want these pieces to kind of go out. So literally, if I set this to say a 10 radius and then try it, you can see they kind of explode out. Boom, boom, boom. Pretty cool effect. Um, you can always press, um, I want to say, 
Oh, you can always undo. So control Z will take back those particular drops that you did. So you can always undo those if you don't want them to be that much. And I will show you here, let's set this back to 100 and I'm going to do the automatic mode. So now if I just hold my mouse down, boom, 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 it'll just pour out like crazy. Be careful with this. It can be super heavy just uh, depending on your meshes and your collisions and your PC and stuff like that. But this is a super cool way to also, uh, per, not procedurally, but dynamically and physics-based scattering and stuff. So let's press escape. We're gonna get out of there. Um, let's see. Okay, so Stoida, you're talking about um, the donut effect and the jiggle, right? So first things first is we actually need to enable a plugin. I'm gonna close these up real quick. So in 5.3, there are some new tools for skeletal mesh creation. So under our plugins here, we're gonna search skeletal mesh editing tools. So we have to turn this on. It's gonna say, ah, oh, it's experimental. I don't know what plugin in Unreal isn't experimental. So you just gotta have to do it. So you turn on uh, that there. There are a couple other plugins that you can turn on, but I think for the most part, this is gonna work for us. We just want the skeletal mesh tools, okay? Let's give it a quick restart. We're gonna save it. And while this restarts, if you guys have any questions, comments, anything, if you wanna drop those in the chat there, I'm definitely more than willing to um, you know, talk about different things and stuff throughout this video here. I just wanted to put together a, a cool little video that kind of talks about physics because there's not really a lot of stuff out there that goes over a lot of the cool physics inside Unreal. So um, or if you have any questions on previous work or stuff that I've done, let me know, man. I'm more than willing to chat about it. All right, so we are going to open up uh, another new level here, another basic one, and we're going to hop in. And <clears throat> what we're going to do is we are going to grab, let's take our one donut here, right? I'm going to put it into the scene. I'm going to scale it up by, say, 10, okay? Um, and like I said, you a lot of times when we're doing physics, you want to scale things up uh, just because if it's too small, it just doesn't work very well. So I'm going to take this donut. Actually, let's do this. We're going to duplicate that donut so that we don't bother our first one there. So select the object, press Control D, create a whole separate static mesh because uh, we're going to make some changes to the actual mesh. And if you do that, it's going to affect the original mesh. So I scaled this up by 10 here. You know, let's, let's do 20. I'm going to make it a giant donut. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're not gonna simulate like soft body physics, but we want this to kinda like jiggle a little bit when we drop it. So this is a very basic, basic overview of how I would go about doing something like this. Um, if you know anything about like weight painting and stuff like that, I'm sure you could come in and make something way cooler. So the first thing we need to do is we need to set this up as an actual skeletal mesh instead of a static mesh, because otherwise it's not gonna do anything. So let's go to our mesh here and we're gonna right click and now that we've enabled skeletal mesh tools, there's a checkbox here, convert to skeletal mesh. Super, super easy. Um, I wish this stuff would have been in Unreal a long time ago, would have been really, really nice. Um, oops, sorry. So it gives a little pop-up here. It says, what do you wanna do? Create a skeletal mesh, and then we're gonna create it as a new one. Oops, we're not going to, we wanted to create a new skeleton and stuff, all that. You don't wanna use a pre-existing one. So press convert. And there you have it. Now it's created a skeletal mesh, an actual skeleton for you. Cool. So if we double click on the actual um, skeletal mesh, when you open that up, we get the editing tools is usually on by default up here. If it's not, just click editing tools. And now we have a skeleton, okay? So, you know, one thing, actually we need to go and the reason we need to do this is because we need to set something real quick first. I wanna make sure we do this because if we don't do this, this could give us troubles down the road. So um, we drug this one static mesh in, okay? And I scaled it up by 20. What I wanna do is I wanna bake that scale into the actual mesh. So like, like right now, if I drag in another, that same mesh, it's super, super small, right? 
So I want to drag in, uh, I want this to stay at that size. So if we come up here and turn uh, the modeling tools, so this isn't the skeletal mesh modeling tools, this is the regular modeling tools. If you don't have that turned on, go to your plugins and search modeling tools. This is the one of the best plugins to have turned on. If you use the third person player character template, I believe this is turned on by default have it turned on. There's so many things that you can do inside. I'm going to do another video covering a lot of the modeling tool stuff because you don't have to go elsewhere to, to make changes. So anyways, make sure modeling tools editor is turned on. Come up to our selection mode here. We're going to switch to modeling, which is shift five. So what I want to do is I actually have it in my favorites here, but we're going to browse through. I want to basically take this size and scale and everything and bake it into that mesh, right? So if I go under right here under X form transform. So there's a section called bake transform. So whatever I've done to this mesh in the scene, whether it's rotation or scale, it's going to bake that into the static mesh so that it always comes out that way now. So um, just you can do it to all LODs. Just keep these pretty much at default unless you want to recenter the pivot, which I'm going to recenter the pivot. So what recentering the pivot does is puts the pivot right in the middle of the object also when it does this. So, and you can choose bake full scale or you can do non-uniform scale. So if you had non-uniform stuff going on in the scaling, or you can say, I don't want to bake the scale. I don't want to bake the rotation. So this is going to bake bake rotation and scale. So I want full scale, recenter pivot. I'm going to press accept. So now if I was to come in the outliner, you can see it's actually bigger right there in the outliner and you can see it's a big donut now. All right. The reason I want to do this is because sometimes when you scale skeletal meshes and stuff, it doesn't always work super nicely. Okay. Back to our content drawer. We're going to right click, go to convert to skeletal mesh. And it's going to give you our pop-up. What do you want to do? Create a new one. We're going to convert. And here in the same folder, we now have a skeletal mesh. So we're going to get rid of our static mesh here. I'm going to center this out and set it to like 500 in the sky. There we go. Now we have our donut floating. So this is our skeletal mesh donuts. Okay. And so I'm going to get out of the modeling tools there. We are going to press Control E again. Thank you for the tip. That's going to open up the skeletal mesh here. And like I said, if you don't have editing tools turned on, turn on editing tools and under skeleton here. So you select skeleton and you're going to press edit skeleton and we're going to press add. OK, and so now you will notice there is actually a root bone inside of our mesh here. So for this donut, we're going to keep it very simple. We're under the add button. OK and I'm going to go up top, uh, top view here. And what I'm going to do is basically you click on the root button and then I clicked kind of out here and then I'm going to go back to the root button and then click over here, back to the root button here, root button and here. If you don't click the root button, say if I click again here, it's going to pull the bone off of the previous bone that you just had selected. So I'm going to undo that. Um, I actually added a few of these. So I'm going to go here again, root button here, root bone. So basically our donut here now has, you know, approximately what? Eight bones in it. <laughs> yeah. Eight bones. So it's a little excessive, but I wanted to, see how well it would work and so forth. So I'm going to hop in to perspective here just to double check. I think, yep. So the root bones kind of at the bottom and then these pieces kind of come out from there. You can, I believe, adjust the root position. So if we select our root bone and I think if I press zero, yep, there we go. So this now set our root bone to the middle position of our donut. So everything's kind of coming out from there. If it's not, you can always come in here and select the point and you can uh, you can move those points up and down if you need. All right, so now we have some bones. So I'm gonna press accept and nothing has happened. So <laughs> it's added all our bones here. Now we need to hop back into uh, the skin section here. 
under um, our editing tools, skin section, and we're gonna bind skin. So this is a very simple automatic weight painting. It basically just takes the bones and it evens out the bone area and stuff. Super basic. So for something like this, work great. This is not how you would want to do like a character or anything like that. You definitely would want to have more control and go in and actually paint the maps and so forth. But for this uh, example, so skin, bind skin, and you'll see it all turns black. As long as it all turns black like that, that is a good sign. Um, you can set like stiffness and stuff here if you want, but I'm just going to keep it at default and press accept. Okay. We are still not done, but let's go ahead and save this here. I'm going to dock that in and then come back over here. So if I'm in here and I click on our donut and I come over to the side and I, you'll see here, I cannot simulate physics. Okay. So a static mesh is real easy to add collisions. You saw we open it up and just go in there and say, press add collisions, right? For a skeletal mesh, it doesn't work the same way. There are complex collisions on a skeletal mesh, but we can't use that to simulate. So to actually simulate this, we have to create a physics asset for the skeletal mesh. So let's hop in here into our content browser. We're going to right click on our, um, uh, sorry, right click on our skeleton, not the mesh, but the actual skeleton, right click. And then we're gonna go up to create, or maybe not, where is it? Oh, sorry, no, it is the skeletal mesh. So on the skeletal mesh, right click, go up to create, and we're gonna choose physics asset, and then we're gonna go to create and assign, because we want it to assign to this one here. So create and assign physics asset. This is gonna pop up here. So basically what this does is it takes and creates collisions for the bones and so forth, So and an actual physics asset so that we can simulate and do stuff like that. So, um, the minimum bone size is basically anything below that. It kind of like ignores it. So what I do is I'm just going to set this to one because I just wanted to get all the bones, especially depending on the scale and size of your skeletal mesh. You don't want it to ignore those bones. So I'm just going to set that to one. And then there's another one here that says walk past small bones. I'm going to uncheck that because I basically want to do that and create body for all bones. I'm going to turn that on. Um, we're... Um, you'll notice a lot of times on characters, it, they use capsules. Now you can do a box, capsule, sphere, and so forth. We're actually going to do a single convex hole um, because that usually gets us a more detailed collision point. Um, and I think that's about it on here. Yep, and create asset. So that's going to take just a second here. It's kind of off to the side and you can't really see it. So that has created a physics asset. So I'm going to close this because I just want you guys to see how you would normally get to this. Okay. So um, this is our skeletal mesh in our scene. So we're going to press control B or yeah, control B will take us to the skeletal mesh, right? So a skeletal mesh has a skeleton. So that's our bones. And then now you can see we have a physics asset here also, and that's what's gonna help us to simulate and collisions and stuff. So let's say if I was to open up my actual skeletal mesh here, in the top right, you can see there's a couple buttons here. One that looks like a skeleton. So that takes us to the actual skeleton for our skeletal mesh. The pink one is our skeletal mesh. And then the yellow one here is our physics asset. So this is an easy way to kind of go between the different uh, objects that we have in our scene. I'm just gonna go ahead and dock these in here. So everything that kind of makes up our skeletal mesh here, skeletal mesh, our skeleton and our physics asset, right? So you can see here, basically our physics asset has been created and all these little purple areas is basically the collisions that were created for this. So it is hard to get very accurate collisions on a skeletal mesh. It just doesn't work that way. What's going on, Luke, man? Yep, nice to see you in here. Um, we're doing some fun physics stuff here. So join in. If you've got any questions about it, let me know. Um, so on the left side here, you're going to see our bones, right? So these are our roots and our joints that we created. And so if we select root, there's a few things we want to do here. So let's hop into our scene real quick. And now that we have our physics asset, I can come over here to our details panel and turn on simulate physics. And if we simulate, bloop, 
we get kind of a weird jiggly jello donut maybe so you can see it's kind of giving us a bit of a weird effect but you're starting to see where something like this could potentially go okay but we need to restrict some of that because it's a little too jiggly for us we don't want a jello donut so if we hop back into our physics asset here you can see we have um, what's called constraints so if you select root and in this little graph here you can see there's these constraints so if we select all of those and come to our details panel over here there's a few things that we can set up to help restrict some of that so if you look in our scene um, you'll see there's these little red cones red cone red cone red cone um, and and a green cone there also it's kind of hard to see but there's like a green cone right so those correlate to two different things. One is bend and one is twist. So what we're gonna actually do first is I wanna come in and I wanna select this first uh, constraint here. And you can see how they're all kind of like pointing, they're all pointing to the right, okay? I want these to point outward of their position. So if I come here and I choose top view, um, Sometimes you can't do these in certain views. No, can't go into the top view because it gets rid of it. So let's select. So this one is pointing outwards, you can see here. And if I take this top one here, I can use the rotate tool. Uh, and let's do our snapping. So let's snap to 15 degrees, actually 45 degrees, make it easier. So I'm going to snap that one so the cone looks like it's pointing towards that way of the donut. And this one, same thing, 45 degrees. This one, we're gonna point it out diagonally. This one is gonna go to the left, down diagonal, and down, and the other one's down diagonal. So now you can see, it's kinda, of, uh, if I select all of these here, now you can see those cones are pointing outward, right? So what that means is that has set up the, the, the restraints in that direction. So when you look at this, I guess the easy way to look at this is the red cone is going to be your bend, I believe. Let me double check. So uh, yeah, so uh, the red is what they call swing motion. So if you think of this cone, it starts here and cones out like that, right? So you can adjust so the cone is like this or like this or very small. And that cone basically says, how far do I want this thing to be able to bend or stretch during like physics, okay? Right now, if you come down here in the details panel with all of those selected, you can see our swing limit is set to 45. That's, that's a lot of swing. <laughs> we don't need our, our donut to be able to like mush over like that so the first thing i usually do is for the donut i don't think i want hardly any twist i'm gonna say five so the twist is you'll you can't really see it but the twist is being done with the green cone that was there but we've made that pretty small we don't really want it to twist that much and then under the swing so you get like up and down swing and you get side to side swing okay so let's set these to like 15 degrees and you'll see as we do that our cones got way smaller so basically we're telling it it's a constraint i don't want these bones to be able to like completely go flexible on us i want them to kind of stay in there there's definitely some other things that you can come in here and dial uh, and adjust you'll just have to kind of play with those yourself um there's like what do you want it to do after it's kind of done? Do you want it to like sleep? Uh, how stiff do you want that to be? Um, there's plenty of other little things that you can come in here and do. Um, there's like, oh, what is it called? Um, yeah, here's like your swing stiffness and a dampening. Like, do you want it to be able to react right away? Do you want it to be more of like a dampened effect? You, you just have to play with this depending on what you're doing. So anyways, let's save this. Let's hop back into our scene here. And so now if I simulate, you can see we get a little bit of jiggle, um, not a ton, but just enough to kind of make it look, look more like a soft body object, like a donut would be dropping into your scene. So I think that works pretty well for doing something like that, okay? So, um, 
this is definitely a lot of extra stuff that you're not necessarily going to do for all your physics because you don't, you know, a boulder rock or something like that. You don't want it <laughs> to jiggle and move and do stuff like that. So this is definitely uh, not necessarily um, what you would do for everything. But in some instances, like this would work really, really cool and give you uh, a way to kind of simulate sort of a fast, soft body physics type effect. Um, another one that I did this with was a fish. Um, so I did the exact same kind of thing. I, I got a, a fish model off a of sketch fab. I added some bones using the skeletal mesh tools, just very simple bones that went down the fish area. I think I went off to the fins a little bit too, and then weight painted it based off of that and added the physics, uh, object to it and assigned it same kind of thing now you get a floppy fish and you just set the constraints okay where the head is i don't want the head to just be able to bleep, totally over i want the head to be stiff but towards the back where the tail is i want the tail to kind of flop over a little bit more so anyways added a few more donuts here and now we can drop those and you can see they feel they feel a little bit better instead of just being these super stiff rock hard donuts falling to the ground you can see we get a little bit of jiggle to them now, like I said, you can go in through and adjust like the dampening and stuff because they st they continue to jiggle and move a little bit, which isn't super realistic. However, I'll show you, this was another donut one that I had done. Um, this was another donut one here that I did doing that same technique. So you guys saw the one with them all falling into a pile. This is a stack of them dropping on top of each other. Soft, fresh, kind of, it's, it's it's a little emphasized too much. Like it's not, I don't think it would really move that much, but you can definitely see where that is like more realistic than just like a bunch of hard donuts going dook, dook, dook. So they kind of flex a little bit into each other. They jiggle, they move a little bit. Looks way better, right? Um, Yeah, breads, jelly, fish, I mean, you could do all sorts of fun stuff. And really, it just depends on how crazy you get with the object. Um, so let's see, just for fun here, we're gonna take this guy, let's open up those physics again. And we're gonna we're gonna crank these through the roof, just so you guys can kind of see. Um, so there's different things here. Um, if you see under angular limits, so these were basically limited, so we can put in the values. You can do locked, which means they won't move at all. And then you can have like total free motion. I'm gonna turn on free motion and save that and we'll, we'll see what happens here. So yeah, <laughs> that is definitely uh, not necessarily what you want, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's something maybe if this was a piece of jello or something of that sort you could you could definitely do that um I, I i don't see where you would necessarily want something to do that you're gonna it's starting to clip through each other and um materials are stretching and stuff like that they're continuing to move um another thing is when you're in your outliner here and you do simulate physics on a skeletal mesh. There isn't a real easy way to adjust like the mass or the weight of something. Cause um, of course mass is going to change. So if you search mass, there's basically a mass scale here. Um, you can crank that up and it's going to make it feel like it's heavier or, uh, you know, it takes a little more to move it or do something. So with your bricks, uh, Unreal tries to calculate that anyways. It basically takes like the actual size or volume of something and gives it a mass. Um, so earlier when we were doing um, the actual, uh, let's see, let me set this back to one. Um, earlier when we were doing the static meshes, right? So on the static meshes, you get basically an actual mass dial. So you can search mass, but right here under physics. And so we simulate physics. And basically what it's doing is based off the size and volume of this, it gives it an actual like weight in kilograms. Um, you can always adjust that dough. So if you want it to be, <clears throat> when we were doing say the gravity effect, right? Let's see, this will probably show a little bit better. So if we do that and enable no gravity, but this is, it's only got like one kilogram of weight, super lightweight, you know? But if I take this and I set that to 
a thousand and then simulate, it's gonna feel like it's got a little more weight and stuff to it. Um, you may not necessarily see it on the gravity effect, but um, what I did when I did the, the donuts falling on top of each other, I adjusted those weights exponentially because I wanted the little donuts to kind of feel like these small lightweight donuts. And so when the medium ones hit, they would kind of boom, pop up. And when that huge donut came down, that definitely did a little more damage and move some stuff. Let's take a look here. Um, yes. So gore, body parts, stuff like that. Absolutely, you could use that as like something gross that's just kind of moving or jiggling around. You could definitely do that. And what's cool is um, I believe you can, same thing, you would just use take recorder and I believe it should record all of that also because um, basically it's still recording it. Yes, it, it'll do that because my particular scene, that's exactly what I did. So in Take Recorder, it records all of that physics and jiggle and stuff also. It does all of that, so works pretty well. Um, let's see, what else was there in some physics stuff? Um, let's do one more little level here. Um, <clears throat> Oh, that skeletal mesh donut. So um, let me share a couple other quick little videos that I, I did recently um, utilizing some physics, maybe a little bit of inspiration. So this here was a little fake coffee ad that I put together. And so this was all physics based. So it actually didn't come out quite how I wanted to. It explodes a little too much. And that's because I was messing around with the time dilation stuff. But um, you can take a look here. So what I did for this particular one is I got this bowl off of Quixel Megascan. And then I used the dropper tool to basically drop all these coffee beans in there. And all the coffee beans have, uh, there's like four different variations, I think. They all have collisions and, and physics and simulations turned on, right? So I poured all those in there using the dropper tool. So that way I could get real life like piled up inside of a bowl. And once I converted those all over to static meshes, I turned on simulate physics and so forth. And then basically what I do is I have this can come out from the bottom of the bowl and the can has, you know, collisions and, and stuff turned on. So it interacts. And what had happened is I basically w had a time dilation on there. But what was happening is the pieces were reacting faster than the actual speed of it that was happening. It was, it was pretty wild, but it gave this really cool like boom explosion effect. And so I know the can looks fake, but it's actually a 3D model in the scene and everything. And you can see where the beans actually like hit and drop off of it. And then once that happens, I just basically ran that through take recorder and ran it through. So then you have that saved each time that you, you know, you can do it over and over and over again. <laughs> um, yeah, 100 percent Arabica. I'm sure it is. You know, I've never actually personally tasted it before, but uh, it was a pretty cool label that I saw. And I was like, I'm going to do this. And the voiceover is actually AI. Um, so if you're interested in doing some cool AI voice stuff, check out um, 11labs.com. Really, really cool site. You can do text and speech to AI voices. It works really, really well. Let's see. How are we doing on time here? We've been at it for about an hour. So I think I got one or two more things that I want to kind of briefly show you here. So let's get rid of this guy here. So that was one that I used um, some pretty cool physics doing. Um, it was super fun and easy. I don't think I have not readily available. I don't believe. Let me let me double check here real quick because I have a couple other older ones that you could see where I had basically um, <clears throat> done some physics stuff with this is this one here so this was sorry give me just a minute here I'll keep you guys waiting too long or keep it boring 
Um, uh, yep. Yeah. So this here was um, one where I was messing around with the um, the gravity. So, like I said, I basically just took this static mesh model off of you know Sketchfab of a fish or whatever, and I added some bones to it and stuff so that they would kind of jiggle and wiggle and stuff. And same thing we did with the donut here. And then basically I have them all drop in and then I was selecting the objects and pressing the checkbox to unsimulate gravity. But you can see there's a bit of a hiccup there, there's a bit of a glitch. So I don't know if there's an easy way of doing that in like Sequencer, which would be really, really nice. Um, this is another kind of gross example of doing, um, uh, the same kind of thing. These were like these little worm pieces and same thing, just added a, a row of bones inside of them so that they can kind of jiggle. But it gives you that like soft body type of physics without actually being soft body and it's all interacting and, and collisions and everything. It just, it's really, really neat. Some of the stuff that you can do in real time and it's a, it's a lot of fun. Okay, let's do, um, let's do a couple other quick things here. So some of you have probably messed around a little bit with um, uh, like a chaos, uh, chaos physics, which is like fracturing and, and uh, like explosion type stuff with like, you always see like the brick wall crumbling, things like that. So we're gonna, we're gonna play around with that real quick. I'm gonna show you how to do something pretty basic. Um, let's go into Quixel Bridge here and we're gonna go search for statue because i think a statue looks pretty cool um and works pretty well um there's definitely some other people out there that do some incredible um video tutorials and stuff like that on um like chaos physics and uh, you know like fracturing stuff um so we're going to briefly touch on some of this because this kind of still falls a little bit into the physics assets uh, aspect of like, you know, simulating stuff and recording things, stuff like that. So I'm just going to do a high quality version of this Roman statue here. We're going to add it into our project and then let's drag and drop this guy into the scene. Um, let's see. A Niagara explosion. Um, are you referring to, um, Sanjeev, are you referring to like Niagara fluids or just any type of Niagara? What type of explosion are you referring to? And while he's putting that together there, we could maybe touch on that a little bit. Um, so, okay, so we got our thing here and to basically, we wanna make this like destructible and it can fall apart and, you know, simulate crumbling and stuff like that. So there's a section in Unreal, real, real easy. It's called Fracture, okay? And so what we can do is we can take this guy here and the first thing you gotta do is generate a new uh, geometry collection. So that's what they call it. Basically, it's a collection of geometry. Once we fracture it up, it, it takes that and puts it into a collection. So we're gonna press new and we're just gonna give this, let's make a new folder called Geo Collections. Okay, and we're just gonna stick to the default name, but you could always call it whatever you want and create the geometry collection. So what this does, um, um, so the chaos fracture with Niagara fluids, I'm not super fluent with that. Um, I will link a guy down in the description. Uh, he has a whole video tutorial on how to combine those two, like Niagara fluids with chaos destruction. And it looks beautiful, it looks so good. So um, I'll link that down below and he, cause he's got some really good stuff that you can follow through. All right, so now you can see it has turned it into this weird checkerboard pattern thing. Um, you can always come in here and hide that, but for now we're just gonna do it. So now that we have a geo collection of this statue, um, there's a couple different types of fracturing that you can do. There's uniform, there's cluster, there's radio planer, brick slice. So depending on what you're wanting to do, like if you want a brick wall and you wanna keep it nice chunky brick wall pieces, you can easily do that. You can slice it up other ways too. Um, so I've used like the radial slice. So say there was a point of like impact in the middle of the ground, you want it to radial out. 
you can do that kind of stuff, which, which is pretty cool. I like Cluster personally. I think Cluster does a pretty good job. So I'm going to choose Cluster here. Um, so when you're doing something, uh, just real quick, Sanjeev, if you're doing, um, so chaos stuff and Niagara stuff and things like that, um, sometimes it's hard to get it into sequencer unless you either do like a take record or they do what's called, uh, Niagara, like a caching. So you might have to cache it out and stuff instead. Um, so maybe that's something we can touch, touch on our next next video of some stuff like this. So in our cluster here, um, basically you're given, and you can see what this is doing. It's creating this wireframe of cluster pieces and stuff in here. So you do wanna be careful with this because the more and more you add, the heavier it is, especially for real time. But if you're gonna do it for cinematics, you might as well crank it up. So you got number of clusters and then max number of clusters. And then there's like a seed and stuff. So basically you can randomize it and so forth. Um, and there's an explode amount so that we can see it a little bit better. So um, this first one, I'm gonna do 2020 on these guys here and you can adjust some other parameters here, but these are your basics. Um, if you come down here, um, there's also a noise amplification. So this is pretty cool because what you can do is um, so that the pieces, if you have zero noise, a piece and a piece is going to be like this, like two flat pieces. But if you add noise, it kind of gives it like jaggedies where they connect like that. Um, it makes it look much more realistic, especially for like concrete and stuff like that. So depending on the frequency and stuff like that, you can, you just kind of have to dial some of these numbers and try it out. So now that I have this, uh, done up here like that. I'm going to click fracture. And what that's going to do is that's going to go through and that's going to break up all those pieces um, and, and so forth. So now that it's done that, you can see in this little list down here, uh, level statistics, it shows level one basically was one bone. Level two is now 267 bones. So now our statue is made up of 267 pieces. So if you scroll up here and you go to explode amount and we crank this out, you can see now that's how many pieces are in our actual like statue okay so we are actually going to do this one more time and so uh with everything still selected as is i'm going to click fracture again with the same values and what that's going to do is now that's going to break it up even more so our basically our first chunk of pieces was about 267 and now our second chunk of pieces is about 1400 pieces so now if i do the explode you can see we have nice small little pieces and some bigger pieces and so forth there. Super, super cool. Um, and I think that's pretty much going to do it for now. We can now just basically hop on out, go back to the section mode. You're going to see it's going to look super weird. So if you come over here, um, you'll notice in the outliner, it's made it a geo collection. It's got like a new type of like a blueprint type icon and it's called a geo collection. So if you search in the details panel here for bone and show bone colors, so if you uncheck that, now you can see your actual piece again. So um, if we come over here and we press simulate, you'll see our thing is simulating. It's randomly tilting and not a whole lot happened, right? So what we need to do is we can do a few different things here. So I'm going to just kind of move this guy up here and we're going to simulate it again, see if anything happens. Nada. Nothing happened, okay? So what we need to do is in our geometry collection, there's a few things that we can adjust in here. Um, let's go, is it damaged? Um, so under physics here, you can see we're going to take the mass and we're going to crank this up like a thousand kilograms. I'm sure it's super, super heavy, right? And we're still not getting any breaking. So it's been a little while since I've actually done this. So you guys are going to join in with me. Um, I want to say, what is it under? It's like under constraints or something like that. I do apologize here. Okay. Damage threshold here. So we have those multiple layers of something to be damaged. So like when we created those uh bigger pieces and the smaller pieces. So I'm going to take these. I'm just going to take these way down. We're going to go like 5,500 and 
5,000. I think if we simulate now, yep, we'll start to get some breaking and stuff. So let's take this even further because I just want this puppy to just be destroyed. Okay, cool. So now you can see where basically we've got all those pieces and they fall apart and so forth, right? So you have to set those constraints. And this is important because you want certain things to break at certain levels and you're going to have to kind of play with these. And depending on what your scene is and so forth, it's going to work differently. Okay. And the piece that you're using, boom. So it's not super, super accurate. It's kind of getting this weird bounce that I don't think it would necessarily get. So one thing we can do is we can come in here and just crank up our mass even higher. So I bet it would be pretty heavy. So that's a little bit better and not quite as much of a bounce there. And um, yeah, we don't really have much dampening on. So what you can do now is since you can take this and basically, you know, do whatever you want with it and you can have it crumble. Our see our levels of breaking is so little that even this little tiny drop is enough to make it crumble and fall apart. So um, one thing that you'll notice here is when we do break it, there's weird stretching material kind of going on on the inside, right? And so all where all the pieces are broken, there's a material slot there, which is actually super, super helpful. So if we come up to here, and we may not have actually created the material slot. Let's see. I don't know if we did or not, unfortunately. So typically when you go and you fracture something, um, you're able to create a material slot for that particular section. I feel like it should be there. I wonder if it's... I might have done something a little bit different, a little bit off, but most of the time there's another material slot here so that you can actually change um, what materials on the inside of your geometry cache. Um, oh, maybe it's this one. Maybe I don't think it's that one though. Let's see. Let's just grab a random material instance and put it in there real quick. Does it look like a donut on the inside? No. I'm um, not too sure. I don't remember offhand. I think we're probably supposed to do it in the first part. Sorry about that, guys. So anyways, so let's say we have this guy sitting on the floor. And if I simulate, it just crumbles right away. I don't want it to crumble right, right away. So one thing you could do is um, make sure you come out of your uh, content drawer and settings. Make sure you have, uh, actually, is it settings? Oh, I always forget where it's at. It's like show engine gun. Let's see. I just have it on all the time. <laughs> but you need to show engine content and show um, plugins. Oh, right here. Show engine content and show plugin content. Make sure you don't modify these files. Um, just make copies of them and stuff. So um, I'm going to come over here to all so that it goes, it covers everything in the, in the actual, you know, content, even engine content. And we're going to search for anchor. And so when we search anchor, you're going to get a couple different things here, but we want this one here. It's FS anchor field generic. Okay. We're going to grab this and pull it into our scene. We're not going to make any real changes to it. So you can just use the one in engine, but I, like I said, I always recommend using stuff that um, doesn't necessarily um, affect the engine content folder. Just make copies of it. So now that we have added that, roughly here in this area. It's like an anchor point. We need to take this, uh, we select our geometry cache. And then if we search over here, is it initialization? Yeah. So under initial initialization fields, <laughs> we're going to come in here and we're going to select our anchor there. So now if we simulate, you're going to see it's not just instantly falling, right? So if I was to delete that there and still do this, even though the anchor is there, it's still like, affecting it, right? So the anchor point basically just anchors that there. So you add that under initialization fields, add that and just choose your anchor field that you added. So if you have multiple anchors, cause you want it to hold, say it's, say you have a wall and you want to bust through the middle, 
Even though everything is fractured, you want the sides to hold. You can add anchors to the sides and top and bottom so only a hole goes through the actual middle of it. Um, pretty cool way of doing that. So now if we simulate, boom, nothing, right? So one thing you can do is let's add in a basic sphere and let's zero that guy out, put him here. He should have physics and everything turned on. Let's set him to movable so that we can move it while we're simulating. So now if I take this guy and do this, you'd see nothing happened. Well, take a look here. We might need to do simulate physics on it. Let me double check. Oh, yeah, there you go. So the object needs to have simulate physics on for it to work. So when I press S, the ball falls because we have simulate physics. But now we have ourselves a nice little wrecking ball that we can literally crush into it and move pieces around. But you can see we have that anchor point there. So it kind of hits that and goes over it. So that way the base of the, the actual like collisions of everything afterwards isn't incredibly accurate so don't <laughs> don't get too stressed about that it's just kind of how it is and we may have fractured this up and gave it a little too much noise i don't think i don't think an actual like concrete piece would look quite this weird and jagged but by using that uh the actual like when you're breaking up the initial pieces and then you break up the actual like noise variation in between that'll definitely change that so this is another way that you can basically come in and do this and simulate physics and stuff like that with the chaos, you know, uh, fracture stuff. It's another really cool way that you can add some pretty wild physics um, to your actual scene. Um, let's see, what can we do with this? That might be kind of fun. Oh, there is another node um, called an explosion. So if we go, um, make sure we got all selected again. And I want to say it's just called like, nope, not explode. It is literally called bomb. So it's another one here. It's called FS bomb field prototype. So if we drag that into our scene and I think if we just kind of set it within range and simulate, there's a couple different things that happen here with this guy. So I'm going to rotate it that way so it looks like it's facing that way. Right now, it's not doing the actual bomb effect. So, But you can see if, if it's over here, our statue does nothing. But as long as it's touching a little bit, we simulate, it does something, right? So it's got a little bit of a time, though, here. So um, there's a on tick with delay, right? So you can do that. So uh, I want to say on tick with delay. And basically, we're going to say, how long are we delaying? So I'm going to have it delay in one second. That's what it's at. And then there's a little checkbox here that says use bomb. So what that does is basically converts it into a bomb. And you can see it actually goes like that, right? It wasn't a very strong bomb, though. <laughs> so we're going to make some adjustments here. So bomb minimum scale, bomb maximum scale. You can kind of play with those values, basically. So you can see the minimum is where it starts. Maximum is where it ends, okay? And then we have bomb duration. We want that to be much faster. We're going to set that to like 0.05. Now if we do it, boom! That, you can see, basically is giving that explosion type of effect, right? So much bigger, much faster bomb effect that we get going there. There's a bunch of other stuff that you can do here um, with bomb stuff. So play around with that. You can set the mass of the bomb. You can uh, just a b bunch of cool stuff. I have noticed that it is somewhat buggy from time to time. So be careful with it. Um, sometimes it's like, dude, it's it's here and it's not doing anything. Why isn't it doing anything? And then sometimes it work. And like, I don't even make any changes and I simulate and it works. Simulate doesn't work. Simulate doesn't work. Simulate doesn't work. Simulate works. So you just kind of have to play with it. But this is a really fun way to do like some pretty wild like um, chaos effects and stuff like that. So let's see. Let's put our bomb stay down here, right? Now we can simulate and then blows out the bottom of it. Um, one thing is this here. You can see it's still being affected by that. 
wonder if you turn off field active. Should do that. I think that's what it is. Is it field active? No. You need to have field active that to makes it happen. Um I want to say there's a way to like turn that off. Anyways, but you can see how that's a pretty pretty fun wild effect that you can get and using the bomb. Like I said, see right now it's not working and I don't believe oh turned it off again. You can see how that would be really cool. You can make some cool effects. Um, and then basically what you have to do is, um, there is a plugin. I don't have it enabled, so I'm not going to do it right now, but if you go to your settings and plugins, and I think if you just search cache, um, yeah, so right here, chaos, I, I do have an enable, I guess it's enabled by default, but chaos caching and geometry cache, um, so those are two things that you can turn on so that you could actually cache the simulation out. Um, let's see, do we want to touch that real quick or no? Some time we got here. We're eh, about an hour and 20 minutes or so. Um, let's see. So what you can do is if you go up to if you select the geometry cache itself and then you go to actor I'm trying to remember it's been a little while okay under chaos create cache manager okay and it creates a window here so we're going to go to geo collections new folder cache we we'll just call it that for now and then basically what happens is that adds to your outliner here yeah, so now you can see we have what's called a G, uh, Chaos Cache Manager. So let's take our bomb real quick. I'm going to set this to not quite as powerful. Go back to our Cache Manager. And then uh, basically this is used as like an experimental method of like caching it out, right? So if we set it to record and you make sure that you have the correct... Um, chaos collection in there, right? So that's our, um, or the cache manager. It's basically, you have to assign that to the manager, but since we did it through the object, it's correct, right? So if we do, we set that to record, and I think all we have to do is actually simulate now, and it explodes, and then we press stop. So since that was on record, I believe that should just do it automatically. And I think if I press play or switch it to play, and then we have to add this to a sequence. So let's hop into a sequence. Bomb. And then I think you take and you add that chaos manager to the sequence. It's been a while since I've done this, so bear with me here. And I think, yeah, okay, cool. So you add the KS Manager in, and then you add a track for start time. Uh, I don't think you have, and yeah, you could do that for if you want to change the actual collection, but we don't want to do that. So basically, there's like a start time and an end time, right? And so um, sometimes it's a little difficult because to, to get the timing lined back up, I'm sure there's an easier method of doing this. So, but basically you're going to add keyframes to where you want it to be. So let's say we're going to do 24 FPS and we have zoom out a little bit here. So 24 FPS and at 240 frames, that's going to be 10 seconds. And then you set a keyframe for the start time and the end time. So Start time is zero because that's when we started it. And then here at the end, you'll adjust this value to wherever you want it. So it looks like it's probably somewhere around. And this is like in seconds. So we're just going to set that to five seconds there at the end. 
So now over a, oh, I guess that's how you would do it right there. So if this is zero seconds and this is five seconds, then actually at 120 is where you would be because 120 frames is going to be five seconds. So that should play back in normal real time there. So now if I go in here, press play, boom, there's our geometry cache saved and stuff. So <clears throat> you would go through and you could hide the bomb and stuff like that. So you're not seeing all that stuff in, in actual playback. Uh, let's see, where's our bomb? We'll hide this guy here and hide our anchor just for now. But now you can see when we play back, boom, get our explosion. Unfortunately, the way the bomb is set up right there, the bomb is still interacting as a like a collision point. But you get the idea. And so if something like this was like super awesome, right? There's a couple different ways like, oh, I want to I want to slow this down. So I'll show you that time dilation track again. So if you come in here, um, sorry, under track and type in time, time dilation. So let's do this. Where is our explosion started? Right about here, right? Boom. So we're going to set a time dilation here and we want that to be real, like regular one speed. And then let's skip ahead like that many frames. We're going to set this to 0.1. And then take it out to about here, set another one at point one, then skip ahead and set that to one. So now if we play this back with the time dilation, it should boom. And it's going to look a little funky because it was recorded at a certain frame rate and stuff. So that's something to be aware of when you're doing that. Um, what you could do is you would probably up that recording rate Excuse me. Speed up the recording rate and stuff or the frame rate of it um, because motion blur is not going to matter until it's actually being exported. So this way the simulation has more data there because it's only restoring, like saving and caching that data of whatever frame rate you're running it at. So you, you got to be aware of that when you're doing that. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Um, any questions, guys? Uh, looks like we're getting a few people kind of dropping off. I hope the stream is still good. It's giving me a low data warning or whatever, but I hope that um, it's still coming through. If you guys have some more questions or want to see something real quick, maybe we can jump into it real real fast, but this is a fun way of being able to do this. Um, and even if you don't want to use the time dilation track, so we could delete that. Let's just say we wanted the whole thing to be a little bit slower. You could easily do that because we know that our simulation, we set our simulation start time at from zero to five seconds. So if we take that and we just drag that out to the 10 second point, that's going to cut it in half. So if we press that and now it's going to play back at a slightly lower rate. Yeah, I'm glad I could share some of this stuff. i um, trying to think of anything else that's kind of, there's definitely a ton more physics based stuff. Um, um there's a, a couple things to do with like chains. Um, I've never unfortunately done a chain thing myself. Um, I have used tools or plugins that I have um, with the chains. So um, I don't have them enabled, but I'll show you real quick which ones I do have. I think I have like two different ones. If I could spell chain correctly. Um... Maybe I don't even have them enabled in 5.3. Sometimes the plugins take a while to get enabled. Um, but I do have two different chain plugins uh, that I use. And those are pretty nice because uh, basically you can choose how many links, how long, how big, stuff like that. And you can have them simulate differently. You can have like one end be loose and one is static and have both ends be loose. You can have both ends be connected and they swivel and sway. There's a lot of neat stuff that you can do with... Uh, with like chain physics and stuff. Um, um, taming chaos cloth, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, chaos cloth is very, 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 very hard unless you're trying to do very simple stuff. Um, I don't, I don't think 
Unreal has the ability to do really good cloth. Um, Cause I've even seen, I think most of you guys probably know Winbush. Um, he did a cloth thing and I, he like showed off a couple things, but then he never even shared how he did it because he said it was so janky and it was hard to work around that um, he just really had troubles with it. I think we could maybe do something real quick with some chaos cloth. Um, just for those who haven't tried it. I, I don't know how to do like all the character stuff and cloth, things like that. I know that becomes a little, becomes pretty difficult. Um, but let me show you. I know one thing that you can kind of do is we'll take our Roman dude here again. Let's hop into the static mesh and make sure we got some collisions. So set up some basic collisions on them real quick. Um, and I don't know if chaos works with complex collisions. That's also another thing that can be, can be difficult. So give this just a second. Okay. Now it's okay. Collisions, not super, super good there, but we're gonna, we're gonna give this a shot. So, um, like I said, one thing that's super nice about having the skeletal mesh stuff built into unreal now what we can do is we can actually do all this inside of Unreal. We don't have to actually go outside of Unreal to be able to do some simple cloth stuff. So I'm gonna make a new folder here. Uh, let's just call this cloth. I'm gonna jump in here and we are gonna make a new mesh. So under the modeling tools, which I, like I said, make sure you enable modeling tools. It's so, so good. So I'm gonna choose a rectangle, right? Um, and I'm gonna uncheck align to normal cause I don't want it to, I just want it to be flat. And I'm going to click and I'm going to kind of move it up just a little bit so we can see it. And we're going to make some adjustments because um, we're going to give it a size, let's say 150 by 150. And then we need to give it some subdivisions. So I'm actually going to do 150 by 150. If you click on show wireframe, you can see now we actually have subdivisions in it. You got to make sure you add subdivisions. Otherwise, the cloth just it don't, won't work because it doesn't have enough subdivisions in there. Um, I think that's good. Size 150. Perfect. We're going to go accept. So now we have our plane there. And then what we're going to do is click on it, press control B. That's going to take us to the asset. We're going to right click and we're going to go to convert to skeletal mesh. Like I said, it's so nice that we have this already pre-built in. We're going to create a new one and press convert. It'll take a second to convert it back over. Maybe if Unreal doesn't crash on us, I think it's thinking. Hey, I'm surprised we went this far without any crashes, so. Did we lose it? Where are we at? <clears throat> nope, still working, still working here. Give it just a second. I guess it's, I mean, it's not super dense, but it's fairly dense. Um. Yeah, so um, with like world position, are you talking about world position offset for, for cloth? Um, go ahead. I think that's probably what you're talking about, world position offset for cloth. Um, you can definitely do that if you want to kind of give it just a very simple look. Um, but we could we could talk about that too. So, okay, now we have our skeletal mesh and we come in here. It's got a skeleton and a skeletal mesh. We don't have to do a ton of other stuff to this. However, let's open up our skeletal mesh here. And what we need to do is uncheck editing tools we are going to activate cloth paint and okay. So before you activate the cloth paint, select the mesh, right click. We're going to create clothing data from selection. Okay. And we're going to come over here. Um, we're not going to give it a physics asset, anything like that. We're super basic stuff. So we're just going to press create and you'll see that created clothing data over here. If you don't have this window up, uh, just make sure you go here um, and check on clothing open that up. So I'm going to select this here and click activate cloth paint. So um, basically what we're going to do is the cloth paint is 
None of it's going to simulate currently until you paint it. So under the cloth paint, you go under the settings here. It's for mesh skinning. And you're going to scroll down. And our paint value is set to 100. So right now when we paint, let me set the brush a little bit smaller just so you can kind of see. <clears throat> brush is a little bit smaller. So pink basically means um, uh, nothing. And then when you paint, it's going to turn white. And so white means it's going to simulate cloth, okay? And there are some other variables. We're gonna see how this works. So we're gonna paint that all white. So now, oops, all of this is gonna be white. So all of it's gonna act like cloth, okay? And then what we do is now that we're done with that, I think we, deactivate cloth paint and then that's going to take a few seconds here because now it's going to calculate all that as like cloth um oh world position offset for chains yeah um i haven't i haven't messed with that like i said for a chain stuff there is a, a like i said a couple chain plugins maybe i'll list those in the description afterwards but um, that make it a lot easier to do chains. Um, I know you can do, um, I'm trying to remember what it's called, but it's like more like a rope. Uh, rope is pretty easy to do and it's got like stretch and stuff like that. Um, and so now that we're here and it's calculated the, the area that we did, we're going to right click on our mesh again and go up, apply clothing data, which is that new one that we did. So now we have applied that. It's gonna take another few seconds to calculate again here. Like, like I said, cloth is cloth is pretty heavy anyways. I probably should have done a little less on this mesh, maybe just a hundred by hundred on the vertices. Um, but cloth is pretty heavy. It it's there's a lot of calculations and stuff going on, especially when you simulate it. Um <clears throat> Can we create sword parts moving animation? Not sure what you mean by sword parts moving. So um, you can see here that our cloth has actually like fallen through the floor, okay? So I'm gonna jump back into our scene here and we're gonna take this and we're gonna slap this up above our dude and see if we can get some, some stuff here. So if we simulate, nothing because this is not the correct this is our static mesh so we need to actually pull in our uh, skeletal mesh and simulate okay we are not getting collisions i'm trying to remember there's a few things here that we have to do i don't think okay um, yes, so under collisions, we need to allow cloth actors collide with environment and force collision update. So those two, I think there should do it. Nope. Let's try something here real quick. Sometimes certain objects, let's do a sphere. Move this over here. Okay, so that is starting to work. <laughs> Obviously, it looks horrible because it's crazy, crazy stretching, and it's still, it's like stopping at a certain point. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of weird, um, weird stuff with cloth. Um, there's a couple decent tutorials and stuff out there. Um, maybe I'll list those down below. Let's hop back into the actual cloth here because there's like, there's like a max distance that you can do it and stuff. Um, so when you have this selected and you select the clothing here, you can come under this section here um, under cloth configs. And there's some stuff that you can adjust in here, like the density and stiffness and stuff like that. Edge stiffness. Um, you need to set this higher. I'm going to quickly. Ah, it's hard. You can't really quickly do stuff with cloth. So we're getting like way too much stretch. Um, and I think we need to turn on. 
You can turn on CCD and self collisions. Ooh, that's gonna that's gonna chug on self collisions. Got to be careful with self collisions, especially something this this heavy. Um, I think it's under iteration count. Let's go to five and see how that does. That's a little bit better. I think we need to take that up even more. Maybe iteration kink, uh, inter iteration count down. But anyways, um, that's, you know, maybe I'll put together a whole nother video. We'll do another live stream with some cloth stuff. I'll go through some different things because I did figure out how to get some cloth with hair and stuff on it, things like that. And I'm just trying to remember there's some, there's some check boxes that you got to make sure you turn on with cloth. And if you don't get it turned on, it just, it just doesn't work very well, unfortunately. Um, and you could see you get a lot of ripping and tearing and stuff like that and stretching. Yeah. But Maybe we'll do another one because um, I can show how to how we can do banners and flags and stuff like that. Because um, even this here, um, I think if we take this and we turn, let's see, rotate this sideways, what do we get? So this slide, okay. So you can see this isn't how you would do this, but this is an example, okay? So um, Right now you have the material and it's hanging there. It's already kind of got some wiggles and stuff to it. So what we're gonna do real quick is um, you come to all in your content browser and search wind. And there is, this is the texture for it, but it's called this here, wind directional source. So if you take this and you bring this up and you can see there's actually, uh, it doesn't matter where you really put it. There's an arrow pointing. So let's kind of give it this direction here. And you go into your details panel for the wind. And let's just kind of crank this stuff up to like five and five. Let's see what happens here. You can see we start to get this ripple effect from the wind, um, kind of like a flag or something of that sort. This is not how you would do this. So I'm just I'm just telling you, this is not how you would do this, but this will definitely give you the idea of how you could simulate like a banner. You would actually add some locking points here and you would do the wind and so forth. But um, this is a, a fun way to be able to kind of do some cool real time flag simulations and cloth. And you could see how like, even if you had like some sort of material hanging over top of something. So let, let's see, I don't, we definitely need to do another video. Make sure you guys hit the like and comment and all that good stuff, man. And get subscribed so you know when I do another live stream. But this will be a good time to figure. We'll, we'll have some fun fun with some cloth simulations. <laughs> you can see here it's kind of ballooning out and stuff. And what's neat about the cloth stuff and everything else is, like I said, it's all real time. So you can, let's set our, let's set our sphere to movable. Um, is it movable? Maybe it's stationary. One of the modes I think you can actually start moving the ball again, but you can do some of this stuff in real time. You can move it around. It's it's pretty wild. Uh, see, so setting it's movable disconnects it, but um, you could see how you could start doing some pretty cool stuff, even just for props in a scene. Say you had a canvas or material laying over some props or a flag or a bed or anything like that, just cloth torn. You could do some wild stuff. Let's see what you guys are seeing down in here. Um, fantasy sword with the blade in parts and animate them to move a bit, then put them back. Um, <clears throat> that's definitely something we could talk about um, and maybe another video doing some animation type stuff like that. Um, and things are just kind of linked together using a parent um, yeah, definitely more physics stuff. Dude, the physics stuff is it's a lot of fun. That's one of the best things about Unreal. Is like it's a game engine. Like a lot of this stuff is built right in. You're not going to get super cinematic physics out of out of it, you know, for the most part. But you can have some fun, especially with stuff in real time. I think just is pretty wild. Like I said, we're getting a ton of stretching on this, but 
I can I can pull this cloth around and movement and it, it's just it's it's a lot of neat stuff that you can do in real time and and have some fun with it and a lot of the stuff you can cash out so that you can actually start using it in in a cinematic or something like that it would look way better and you could definitely cheat something like this with world position offset if you're just kind of want a super basic effect and you're not trying to actually simulate something but maybe for like actual like um uh physics and stuff like that you would want to to do that let me try one more quick thing here so if i move this over here and we simulate and then actually we are going to instead of simulating we're going to play as our no we may not have collision set up for that but that's something you can do you can actually start to have some fun and and collide and stuff like that hey how's it going ian yeah it's good to see you man uh, jumping in on the live stream i'm trying to i'm gonna try to do more of these hopefully a couple a week um you know i gotta get this youtube stuff rolling this is my job full time now in case you guys haven't uh, aren't aware um i will say i have started a patreon and i know everybody's always asking for money and stuff but if you guys are able to jump in i think i have some some low dollar tiers or if you just want to join for free and just just hang out and see what kind of stuff comes out. But I have some cool tiers that'll get you some free assets, the uh, sample packs of some of my photo scan stuff. Um, I really appreciate that. All that kind of stuff helps. Uh, make sure you check out all my assets and stuff on the marketplace. Um, I have a couple tools and several packs of like photogrammetry stuff that I've scanned in myself and really, really, really cool stuff. I really re appreciate that. That definitely helps. Every little dollar helps and stuff to do this kind of stuff full time. Um, also make sure you guys check out createunreal.com. Uh, this is going to be kind of the hub for everything of my stuff. So all my live streams, tips and tricks, and a lot of times some of the stuff is coming out there a little bit earlier than on YouTube. So make sure you check that out. Um, and it showcases a lot of my assets and stuff like that. And, uh, I'll give you guys, I'll give you guys a quick little sneak, sneak peek at the end of this. So, um, let me open it up for any more questions or comments, anything like that, and um, some suggestions. We'll definitely do another video. We'll, we'll maybe we'll do a whole video on some cloth stuff. Would be really really cool. Um, we, we can do some stuff on like Niagara fluids. Um, there's a ton of really cool stuff in in Unreal, but sometimes it's hard to get it and kind of get it all in one place and get inspiration on how you can use those things in your scenes. Um, let's see what else we got here. Looking forward to your your next stream. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you guys jumping in. Doing this live is a lot cooler. I I checked my YouTube analytics and because my last live stream didn't do very well, um, but apparently it was like one of the worst days and worst times for most of my viewers to be on. So I've tried to calculate that. It looks like Mondays and Tuesdays, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays in the morning for me. Uh, this is about nine, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock now. Um, that seems to be a better time for everybody um, or most of my viewers. So this is probably one we'll do most of these. Kids are at school, so forth. So um, I appreciate you guys jumping in. These live streams are great because we can connect, ask questions and stuff. Um, I might even do one where we can, maybe we'll link up through Discord or something and I can help go through some of your projects or maybe even give my feedback on some of your guys' projects and stuff. Uh, that might be a lot of fun. Um, I'm trying to animation on a sword, but can't seem to bring them together in Unreal um, from Blender. Um, you know, I'd, I'm not too familiar with bringing any type of animations or sequences across from Blender to Unreal. I do everything in Unreal. So um, if uh, if that's something, maybe you could jump in and ask some questions. Uh, do check out my Discord also. Um, I'll, there's links in the description of um, YouTube here. I'm I'm usually in there pretty I like I I hang out on a different Discord channel most of the time but um if you have questions and stuff like that definitely check out you know my Discord it's a great place to ask stuff about you know if you have got questions for me I don't mind reaching out and, and helping people and stuff um probably several of the people that are in here know that they've probably talked to me on Discord and I'm always willing to help out if I got the time and so forth um but jump into my Discord you can always ask questions whether it's about my assets or other things like that there's a pretty cool like group of people in there and it's growing and they're always more than willing to uh to help out it should be down in the description there man uh for the Discord link um if it is not then uh, we can always I will definitely add it 
Or you can always check any of my other videos. They should be down in that one. It is not in the description. I will get that for you and I will put it in the description after this live stream. So um, if you get a chance, uh, definitely check it out. I'm sorry, yep, <laughs> no Discord link in there. Um, if you go to createunreal.com, I know for sure I have it there at the uh, very bottom. So let me just copy the link and I will paste it here right now. There you go. Um, but yeah, create Unreal. You can sign up for a newsletter because I'll be sending out new stuff. This is going to be the general hub for everything. So make sure you get in there, uh, sign up for the newsletter, check it out, you know, bookmark it so you guys can come back to it. It'll be a lot of fun. And anytime I do some new stuff. So um, I think that's going to do it for the physics stuff that we're going to go through today. Um, I do want to share with you guys something very exciting that I have been working on. So let me actually save this project real quick and close it. And I'm going to show you something pretty cool that I've been working on. And you guys can actually go and download it if you would like and try it out. Also, please be aware this is still very, very early. There's probably bugs and there's not a ton of content yet. Um, I actually have a huge update that should be coming out within the next couple days. Um, so you what I'm about to show you isn't uh, isn't what you'll be able to get right now, but you'll be able to get it in a couple of days. So I have been working on a game. I'm going to turn on my desktop audio here. So hopefully you guys will get that. Give me just a second here to actually size the window and stuff. Go to my settings. I'm going to set this to windowed and we're going to do that. All right, it's popping in and out for my snap points. Cool, I think you should have it there. So yes, I have been working on a game called Fractal Maze. Um, I am using this pretty cool uh, blueprint tool that I picked up on the marketplace that allows you to create this pretty cool fractal effect, um, or that's what I'm calling it. It's called, it's kind of like a symbols pieces. So you can take all these static meshes and it'll build them or separate them. And uh, so this is kind of where I'm at. I've made some pretty good progress over the last few weeks. This is only about maybe about three weeks worth of work that I've been doing. I am not a gamer programmer, game programmer. I love the game um, and stuff like that. And I like doing artwork. So I'm pretty excited to actually start building the style and aesthetics and the maps and stuff. But I want to give you guys a quick little preview of how this is done and how it's working. So this is your main screen here. I do have settings built in already. So this was a, a huge thing I had to get done right away because not everybody's got high end hardware. So you can come in, you can adjust your graphics settings so that uh, if you would like to try it out and run it, it's about one and a half gigs or so at the moment. Um, as I add some more stuff, it's probably going to get a little bit bigger. I know it's kind of big already, but it's because I have a lot of assets that are in the project that I haven't necessarily used, but I don't want to get them out yet until I know that I'm done with them. So, um, but there's some settings here for graphic settings. So even if you don't have the, the highest end hardware, you can still kind of get in and play it, try it out. Um, make sure you you know get into the discord and leave comments and some feedback i'm going to start a whole section for the game so that you guys can leave you know what kind of fps are you guys getting what's your hardware stuff like that report bugs stuff like that i would really appreciate it this is this is that time that moment where i need some help and assistance uh and getting this done so that you know i can make it uh, an actual potential game that is the plan so um some audio settings and so forth um, and let's just go ahead and click play here. <clears throat> I've already added some loading screens and stuff like that. So this is the general idea of what we're going to be doing. So this is the level selector map. So basically they are mazes and the, the, I guess the twist or the kick about it is you can't see the maze. The maze builds around you as you move. So, um, 
I plan on having several biomes and different styles. So as you progress through the levels, um, each biome will probably have about 10, 10 or so mazes. And as you complete those or get a certain score, you'll be able to progress to the next biome, which will open, unlock a whole different style of world and stuff. So um, this is basically the level selector here. So it's a kind of a top down 45 degree isometric kind of view. And I'm gonna just hop in a couple things here. So if we go over here, this is the practice hmm. map. So this is the, the practice the map. Side. So this gives you an opportunity to kind of come in and check out some of the game mechanics. So if you come up here, oh, and so as you can see, the the maze and your platform builds around you as you walk and move so that is kind of like why it's called fractal maze the pieces assemble around you and as you move you know you reveal part of the maze and so forth so um here you can go off to the game mechanics or you can start like a practice maze that direction so i'll show you real quickly some of the game mechanics here you have walk and sprint there is a jump um so this is like one here it's kind of like a thin chain walk so you got to make sure you walk on the chain um this is just showing that you can do a ramp style so there will be multi-level mazes that you'll have to traverse different stuff uh this is just a staircase it's just different styles different things that i've been trying to work into the game um you have a vertical platform so these will be moving platforms that you can get onto and move vertically there's horizontal platforms of course so this will just add another little element. And then we have what's called a physics object at the moment. So you're able to pick it up and move it. So some of the areas, so I'm gonna show you like, so like right here, I can make that jump. That's basically about one, whoops, <laughs> we'll reset. That's it about one block wide. I can actually inside. make that jump, you know, with sprinting. Um, whereas this jump here is about one and a half. So by using this physics, prop here i can actually jump up top of it and this gives me a little more um so i could get across so normally i couldn't make that jump so this is just another little element that i'll be able to add in to use to actually make you know make it a little bit harder and as the puzzles and stuff grow i'm gonna add i have other mechanics and ideas so if you have ideas or suggestions make sure you um Hop into the Discord. That's going to be the best place. You know, send me a message or post it in there, and that's going to be a great way to for me to look and see. Because I'm I'm super willing and open to suggestions at the moment because it's growing. It's still very very new. Um, my dog wants out. So, I anyways, I am going to cross like the line here, and you can see it starts a timer at the top. So the the levels are uh, you get a time. So depending on how quickly you uh, finish you'll actually get a better score um, based off of that. And I am so sorry, I'll be right back. I need to let my dog out. Sorry about that, y'all. So um, depending on how quickly you finish the level, you will get a star rating. So one, two, three stars. And so um, basically once you get a certain amount of stars, you'll unlock the next biome. That is the plan. And then you also have PB there at the top. That's your personal best um, time that you have finished. Um, a couple other game mechanic things that I have built in are power-ups. So I'll show you those real quick. So. This is a jump boost. So this is about your normal jump height. And if you click that, now you get a higher jump boost so you can make some longer jumps. And it lasts for about, you know, a certain amount of time, a few seconds or so. I think this one's set at six seconds. So you can see it's already gone away. So these would be like little power-ups. Next one is a view increase or uh, like a vision boost is probably what I'll call it. So if you do that, now you can see the platform starts to reveal at a wider like area and stay there so this might be a nice way to like discover where some of the platforms are that you don't know about yet and then after 10 seconds or so that will decrease and go back and then last but not least of the power-ups is or at least at the moment is a speed boost so this is kind of like your normal walking speed and then this is your run speed now. So this one definitely help you maybe when you start to speed run. Uh, so that's kind of the idea is like, you'll do these mazes and then eventually people want to speed run them and get like 
high scores and stuff like that. I would love to put together probably like an online scoreboard or leaderboard or something like that would be really, really neat. Um, and so anyways, uh, this kind of gives you a big uh, sample map here and that you can kind of play around and try out. Um, these will be like kind of how the environments are done. I got lots of stuff built in. So Oops. if you fall, uh, you die down below and it will respawn hmm. you. There must be a way um, to get the gem on the other side. Pretty cool game mechanics there. Uh, I've been working on a lot of different things. So there's an in-game in menu and stuff. So you can go back to the map select, main menu and so forth. Um, so let's go back to the map select and I will show you <clears throat> one of the actual maps. So you can see here, these are like locked here and you can't get into these next ones. But as you progress, um, you will be able to unlock those uh, levels in, in order and stuff. So let's hop on over to our first map here. Hmm. And so this is our first official level side. one map. Um, you can see level one. So I am actually careful. going Looks to, like I'm gonna to reset fall. real quick. Uh, by hmm. pressing R. Must I'm going to do a quick little speed run for y'all so you can kind of see how you would uh, do a speed run or something. And you'll see how you get uh, a scoring system up top. So let's go for this. I better be careful. This one Looks I know like pretty well. Obviously, fall. I know most all of them because I have built them. However, um, even knowing them doesn't always mean you're going to land it just right. So... So that is an example oh, of a pretty good speed off. run. So 14 and a half seconds and I got a three star rating. So as you do that, you will see above level one, you get a three star rating with a 14.5 uh, second run. And you can also see there in the bottom is a pretty cool um, like scoreboard for this particular biome. It'll list all those as you get there. And now you can see level two is unlocked and up into level two. Hmm. And I know it looks very similar. The so side. the environments will, the environments will progress for sure. Um, it is different. It looks very similar at the, uh, at the beginning, but this particular biome is probably going to be called Fantasy Skies. So these are like this fantasy kind of castle look, but you're up in the skies, so above the clouds and so forth. But each biome is going to have its own style, look, and kind of like how it's done. I have ideas for like say. Oh, maybe a, <clears throat> a desert style with quicksand is what you fall into or one that has lava that you fall into or a river or something of that sort. Um, so different types of ways that'll be done, but they're all going to have this basic building mechanic, this fractal maze look and effect here. So until you actually get used to the map, you can see how this could actually be very um, kind of disorienting and you're, whoop, you're not really sure where hmm. you're going and what you're there doing. So that is the plan the and you're going to get to the gym on the other side and, um, and go from there. So yeah, anyways, um, give me a couple days and you could probably download this version will be available. Uh, this is basically version 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.20. And, uh, you'll be able to check this one out. This one actually has the level selector and stuff like that. I do have a version that you can download now if you want to. It's on createunreal.com. At the top, you go under games and choose Fractal Maze. It's got some information there. It's a whole page about stuff. Um, let me actually drag this over. You can take a look. Um, let me close the game out. And like I said, uh, where are we at here? There we go. Um, if you go to createunreal.com, go to games and choose uh, Fractal Maze. And there's some information here, a little trailer. Um, this does have a little update fix here, but if you have not ran previous versions, you don't have to worry about that. So you can just close it out. Um, I actually have that all fixed and you don't have to do anything anymore. But there's a little trailer video here. You can check it out and kind of figure out what it's about. Some cool screenshots. You can see how some of the stuff has already progressed. Um, the main menu has already changed from this to something else. Um, general story is she is going to be the hero character. And um, basically our world in time and space has become... Uh, disoriented and fractalized and so she is going to travel back in time and space and to collect these pieces to reassemble time so that's kind of what gives you the idea of her being able to go to these different biomes and places um, and so it, as she travels uh, her character skin and body will change and stuff um, or clothing and and so forth so 
that'll kind of keep that fresh uh, based off the different biomes. Here's some of the stuff that's planned out and so forth. And um, I, there's some release notes on everything that's been done since. So a lot of small little updates. Um, there is a group of people on not my Discord, but another Discord that's been really helping me out because this takes lots of feedback and opinions and suggestions. And so I really, really appreciate uh, all of that from everybody who has helped. Um, let's see, anything else? Yeah, like a giant world or something like that would be pretty wild where everything's like huge, giant bugs and stuff like that. Um, there's not going to be any like fighting mechanics or anything like that. It's more of more of a puzzle slash speed run slash like obstacle course kind of thing is what I want it, the game to be. Um, so there, I think there's going to be eventually there's going to be moving objects and things that could hit you off the platform, stuff like that. So those will definitely be added in different biomes and as you progress and things get harder and so forth. So a lot of stuff, there's some FAQ here if you have any questions or anything like that. Like I said, leave some feedback. Um, join the Discord, I would really appreciate it. And really, uh, the community grows and we all grow together and I'm more than willing to help out and, and you guys help out too a lot. So that's awesome. Um, any last questions before we take off here? Um, if you guys have any questions about particular artwork pieces I've done or anything like that or any anything that we can answer quickly um, without getting in too technical. Um, you can put those in the chat and we can discuss them very quickly. <clears throat> trying to think anything else. Like I said, definitely check out the website. I did do a recent uh, asset review. Um, if you have any suggestions for other assets, um, I have a lot of assets. If it's something I have, um, I could definitely do a, a review about it. We did one of this uh, sci-fi character here, and it was a ton of fun. Um, this is one of my favorite um, assets that I own for, like, character-wise. Uh, super high quality, high detailed, and um, we kind of go through the asset and, the you know, the textures, the materials, what all it comes with. Um, and I've done this on a couple other things, William Fouché's tutorial, or... Um, uh, fog tool, this environment here. We've talked about a couple tools for hair, and um, this is that dropper tool that we did. Uh, yeah, when we first started the stream, there were several pieces of artwork there. Yeah, um, I could show a few of those and stuff, and we could uh, take a look. So um, this is a recent one that I did here, and this one is called... Uh, Pirate's Booty. Um, so this was for, if you're not a part of the Clinton Jones Punisher Discord channel, I would definitely check it out because I usually am in there all the time in the voice chat and um, they have weekly challenges. So they give you a prompt and you just kind of make something. It's it's something to kind of keep you fresh and keep you moving and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not too hard. Um, Um, yeah, so this one was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, so the pirate characters are some assets from the marketplace um, called like skeleton pirates or something like that. Um, there was one uh, free month. They gave a bunch of treasure assets. So I'm using some treasure assets here. Um, I'm basically, if you watch my other video on how to do the underwater scene, a lot of the elements of this one is the same in that underwater scene. So I used coral pieces from Mega Scans, and then I used the IA Scatter tool to basically cluster and stack these in kind of a cave look. Um, I used it to scatter the coins and scatter the um, the gems and stuff. I also used it to scatter all the ground coral and all the like the weeds and uh, underwater like foliage. Um, then I I uh, found a boat. Um, I think I'm on the real marketplace. I think I might've already had it or maybe I picked it up. It was on sale, but really nice, fairly detailed boat. Unfortunately, it's way in the back. You don't even see it, but creating something like this would definitely show up pretty good in, uh, if you watch that video of doing the underwater scene, a lot of the same elements are located in here. So just using, um, uh, exponential height fog as a density, like to create that underwater feel, with some water or some lights that create, you know, uh, volumetric casting and stuff. Uh, the lens flare is done in post and, and Photoshop. So 
I knew these were all going to be still images and so forth, but just some fun shots and different things you can see. It's very, very detailed. These are all like crazy nanite um, coral rocks and stuff down there that are covering the entire scene. Um, this is the boat here that was fallen and stuff, growth all over it. This is a quick little breakdown um, of like what it looks unlit, the detailed lighting, lumen, and then path tracing. So all the renders were, were done final in path tracing and stuff. So it looks pretty good. Yeah, I really enjoyed that underwater stream. It was uh, a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, a cool way to like learn some techniques. I think, a, you know, when I have something in mind that I want to build and I know pretty well how to do it, I would love to do more live streams of those. Um, both uh, the underwater one and the other one that I did, uh, the alien world, those were two that I had already created. So I knew what I wanted to do. But a lot of times the creative process takes just hours of like trying something and switching back and forth. So if you're, I'd hate to have somebody in on a live stream unless I knew pretty well what I was doing because it would be a very, very long live stream. <clears throat> um, let's see. Some of the next ones that I did recently was this one here. Um, this was for the prompt for the weekly challenge was new beginning or small beginnings. So... Uh, these are a couple mega scans trees and I took mega scans plants sticks mushrooms and then I used the IA scatter to scatter all this stuff so setting up different scatter systems to scatter these like uh, shelf mushrooms on the trees and scattering these more like puffball mushrooms at the bottom um and then I scattered all of the plants, little tiny like mossy clovers at the bottom. And then I got this one plant off of Megascan. It was a decent one, like a flower looking thing. Put that there. Um, it's kind of hard to see at this scale, but there's actually little tiny water droplets and ants on top of the plant. So I hand placed these water droplets because I wanted them in specific spots. But then I actually had the ants procedurally scatter and from a point to a point so that they would just kind of walk and wrap around the plant anywhere it looks really really good um <clears throat> went with a super nice shallow depth of field um the is this is just anything beyond this one tree right here is just hdri so i found something that had pretty similar colors and look and stuff and of course it's blurred out pretty heavy so super super nice sh shallow depth of field um, I think it came out really, really well. It kind of has this, everything has a wet feel. I set up the, I turned down the roughness of most everything. So everything kind of had like a glossy, wet kind of look. Um, there's actually a ton of raindrops. You can't even see it in the render, unfortunately. But like way down here, you can see these little specular highlights. That's actually a bunch of little raindrops that were scattered too. But you just don't even, you don't even actually see them. Yeah, so there are the water droplets on the leaf. Those were hand placed, but then I, I have a ton of other ones that were all procedurally scattered on top of everything else. It was pretty crazy. Uh, done in path tracing. So that's why the water droplets look really good because Lumen just doesn't do very well with like glass or water look. Um, but yeah, done with path tracing. Most everything I do is is in path tracing. A um, little bit of Lumen and ray tracing. Um, these water effect, like the lens flare stuff that's done in post, but you could do stuff like that in engine. The problem is, is once you render it out, it's kind of baked there and it's hard to adjust it later. Let's see anything else recently that I've done. Um, I haven't really done a whole lot Been working on the game project, actually a lot. Um, this was another one here. Um, let's see. So uh, there's a new, not a new website, but a website called 3D Scan Store. Um, and they do 3D scans of humans. And they have a whole new category called metahuman identities. So if you're looking to take your metahuman to the next level, this is the way to do it. It does cost money. Um, if you can catch them on sale, they're a little bit cheaper and stuff. But basically, it's a scanned photo or a scanned 3D model of an actual real person. And so you use the mesh to modify your metahuman with mesh to metahuman. And then they have their own textures. 
So you bring those textures in and you blend them with the metahuman like wrinkle paths and stuff. And it's nuts. It looks so good. Um, you can see this is one here. Um, another little thing that I've been using is called Meta Tailor. If you're not familiar with that, check out Meta Tailor. Um, it is really, really cool. You're able to basically import any character model and whether it's rigged or not and take clothing. So you can get clothing from anywhere. Sketchfab, ArtStation has a ton of like marvelous designer stuff for super cheap, like a couple bucks. And you bring it in and it will basically tailor, rig, and weight paint the clothing on any character. It is wild. So I basically took the MetaHuman here, exported it out uh, just a skeletal mesh FBX, imported it into MetaTailor, you know, choose a couple features. It kind of does it like Mixamo. You choose a, a key features on the body. And then I took, I got this outfit off of ArtStation, which is like a crazy marvelous designer, super nice. It didn't come with, this one came with textures, but it wasn't already on there and applied. But anyways, you put the clothing in there and it tailors it, fits it, weight paints it. It's wild. And you can do layering. So you can do a jacket on top of it. You can do a shirt, pants. They have stuff that's included. Plus you can add even more. Um, it, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, I don't think I'll be... I don't have anything necessarily coming up for MetaHumans and video stuff um, at the moment. I might do a little something on this would be pretty cool if people are interested in doing some um, super high quality MetaHuman stuff. I want to do a little bit more myself with like the face capture and using MetaHuman Animator. Um, once I get that down pretty well, I will definitely share some of that too. Um, anyways, a couple other shots here of this one character, but super super crazy detailed uh this is one that i did do recently for a prompt um it was like santa's factory or something like that uh this was a pretty cool environment i got off the marketplace called like workshop and it's like all these photo scanned like it's like somebody's old garage and they photo scanned the benches and the walls and every little piece in there it is really cool so if you want something like super cinematic Super, super nice. And then I added all the toys and props and a Santa and stuff like that. Um, fun little project. This is actually another MetaHuman one that I worked on recently. This is actually the same base character from 3D Scan Store as the other one I just showed you. But they also come with like paint masks that can go on there and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, this one definitely had a kind of that ah Ahsoka... Star Wars kind of feel to it. I, I was just having some fun. Another piece of clothing that was from uh, Art Station that I used Meta Tailor to put on there and then set her up. Uh, the environment is actually an HDRI used. Uh, it was created using, I forget what it's called, but if you search like AI generated HDRI, there's a place where you can go and type in prompts and it'll actually make you an HDRI based off that prompt. So I did like Star Wars, Grey Tone, Ahsoka, something like that. And that's uh, kind of what it came up with. Um, this is another fun little thing. Uh, if you have a high-end computer, let me know. I made like another little game environment. It's not really a game. It's more of just like a, an experience. <laughs> and you can walk through this crazy dense forest at night and stuff. And it's kind of cool, kind of fun. And I think, let's see, this would probably be the last one here. I don't think anything else new since then. Uh, this is microscopic. So I was trying to go for that crazy microscopic look. Um, I picked up a basic ant model off of Sketchfab. And then believe it or not, this, all these little pieces and stuff on there. So this is scaled up pretty large. It's not actually that small. Um, but all these little pieces on the ant and on the ground is actually my photo scanned lava rocks. So I basically took my photo scan lava rocks and I changed the material and stuff on them. So this is like an incredibly dense, high quality nanite, like crazy, crazy scene. Um, and then I used IA scatter to scatter it on the bug and on the ground. And then I built out these little tubes in Unreal, like kind of look like hair pieces. And then I scattered these other little tube pieces coming off of it. And then I have like these little fake hair pieces, just little simple pieces of geometry that look like hair. 
and I took those and then scattered that also in like little clusters all over it. But um, in 95% of all of this is done in Unreal. There's like a little bit of 5% that's just basically a little bit of color adjustment and what and like a high pass filter in Photoshop. But other than that, almost all of this was achieved in Unreal, which is pretty cool to kind of get that uh, electro electromagnetic something. I forget what it's called, but a very cool uh, kind of look and unique style. So already, guys, I think that is about long enough for the stream. I appreciate you guys all jumping in and joining and uh, checking out and giving feedback and questions and so forth again. Um, if you're willing to man, check out the, uh, the Patreon. I would really appreciate it. This is, um, this is my full-time job now. This is what I do. So, uh, and I am absolutely enjoying it. I'm hoping to make more and more and more content. I would love to put together possibly a course. I know there's a lot of people that kind of look up to some of the stuff that I do and the style that I work on. And so maybe I could put together some sort of course, um, that you guys could actually, uh, sign up for and do it. But I love giving out free content also. So make sure you check that out. But on the Patreon, like I said, you get a, uh, if, depending on which tier you sign up for, you can get some, some free ma custom material shaders that I've built. You can do, um, the higher tier has like sample packs of my photo scanned assets. So like seashells, smooth stones, lava rocks, brown rocks. Um, I got little sample packs. You can actually download those and try them out and stuff as part of the Patreon. Plus you're supporting me and I, and I really appreciate that. And if you don't, know, you guys know, if you've got questions and stuff, always just hit me up and stuff. Um, check out create, check out create unreal.com. Um, that's my main hub of everything that, uh, like subscribe, all that good stuff here on YouTube and uh, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Instagram, Twitter, I even have a Facebook one, but Facebook's not very often, but Instagram, Twitter, I would definitely appreciate that. All that stuff helps out the algorithm. You guys know how it goes. So I would greatly appreciate it. And, um, you know, until next time, and we'll do another video, and maybe we'll do some cloth physics or some other stuff like that and kind of go through some different techniques and inspiration for that. Or maybe we'll jump into some more uh, chaos physics and stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can do and destroy and, and uh, break up, and it'd be a lot of fun um niagara stuff niagara fluids there's a lot of cool stuff coming out nowadays that's pretty wild um lots of fun stuff so anyways thanks again um check out all the links down below like thumbs up all the good stuff i appreciate it